WEAF, New York. An analysis of the latest reports from the invasion front brought to you by the Dean of American Commentators, NBC's H.B. Cottenborn. The most encouraging fact about this invasion from the Allied point of view is that we had 4,000 ships and 11,000 planes with which to cover it. That means two great things, control of the sea and control of the air. And through control of the sea and control of the air, the powers that have gathered in the British Isles the mighty invasion force that has now begun to land, through that control, they will be able to establish control of the land. Everything that has happened so far indicates that that control has already begun, has moved more rapidly than even those of us who were most sanguine have dared to hope. For we all had in mind the experience of the earth. We had in mind some of the difficulties that we had experienced in Africa, in Sicily, in Italy. And yet, here in France, so far as we now know, many of those difficulties were either eliminated or overcome for it is certain, on the basis of German admissions, that we have penetrated the estuaries of two important rivers in Normandy, that we have landed tanks in large numbers behind the so-called Hitler Atlantic Wall, that our paratroopers landed successfully at key points in Normandy and elsewhere, and that, so far, the invasion, as Mr. Churchill told Commons this morning, is going according to plan, and what a plan. In other words, we've made a magnificent start. Obviously, the Germans are only now beginning to recover from their first surprise, for it evidently was a surprise. They had obviously counted on our taking advantage of that short 20-mile distance between Dover and Calais. They had not counted that we would risk the 80-mile crossing from southern England over to Normandy, and they were evidently not as well prepared there as they were presumably prepared across the channel. Certainly, that helped us in our opening moves. All the German admissions are significant, for obviously they would not make them unless they felt they had to. We penetrated into the estuaries of the Seine and the Orne rivers. The Seine, tremendously important, because once we control that estuary, we are in a position to fight for the possession of the tremendously important port of La Havre, which the French only in recent years developed to the point where it is their most important transatlantic port, with every possible equipment for the landing of every type of ship. And the control of the estuary of the Orne River means control of the important town of Caen, a great railroad center in Normandy, and undoubtedly also a center of airfields, which in the flat country surrounding that particular area could readily be established in considerable numbers. And of course, it is our purpose in landing on this particular part of Normandy to secure for our use some of those airfields. And while we have no precise indication that our paratroopers who have landed in large numbers are landing there for the purpose of seizing airfields, we know that that undoubtedly is the plan which they would follow. For once we control the airfield, our control of the air can then be transferred from the coast of Britain to the coast and to the inland points of France. And if we begin with airfields in that flat country in the neighborhood of Cain, get control of those, then we are in a position from there to move steadily forward from one airfield to another in cooperation with our landing forces at various points on the French coast. And according to the reports that have come to us, our landings are not confined to Normandy. They extend much farther to the north and to the east along the Channel coast. They go as far as Boulogne, and some have been made even east and north of Boulogne which means that we are alerting the Germans at a dozen different places along something like 250 miles of coast so that already their railroad problem 
is a difficult one because they are unable to concentrate their forces at any given point. They must be prepared to meet what might be a major thrust anywhere along 250 miles of coast, and it is a 250 miles of coast where for the past two years we have been bombing the railroads, bombing every possible type of construction that could aid those who would resist invasion. We have landed heavy armor. That too comes from the Germans. They tell us of one tank battle in which they claim to have knocked out 35 tanks. Well, perhaps they did knock out a score or even more of tanks, but how many more were left? For obviously, if we have penetrated the estuaries of those rivers, if, thanks to this huge invasion fleet of 4,000 ships and other smaller ships, we have managed to get up into those rivers with these landing barges, which again and again at various fronts I have seen discharging their tanks by rolling right up on the shore. Why, it's quite possible that we have landed hundreds of tanks at several points. And once we have succeeded in doing that, then we are in a position to carry on, to move over the excellent French roads, to follow up with armor, with mechanized material, so that we can move with speed, move with precision, move with firepower. And here, that vast accumulation of military material which we have been building in the United States, which we have transferred to the British Isles, and which today has begun to land in France, will stand us in good stead. A bulletin from an Allied air base in England tells us that many Allied assault troops are now already beyond the initial danger zone of total exposure in France. That means that they have established themselves, that possibly they have made connection with the landings on the coast, that they are no longer isolated units defending themselves alone against superior forces of Germans, but that already contact has been established between those forces that were landed 10, 15 miles, 20 miles inland and those that are landing barges Land, and those that are landing barges deposited on the shore where they established their beach positions. The Germans tell us that we have definitely established ourselves in at least two places firmly so that we have been able to not only to hold the beachheads but to penetrate beyond them to force our way inland, which of course is the test of any successful invasion. Within the last few hours, British heavy bombers dropped 5,000 tons of bombs on the Channel Coast batteries. That happened last night and early today. That's a new record of bombing. That climaxes two years of bombing. That reminds us how magnificently our great air power has paved the way, paved the way successfully for today's events. The Germans tell us that landings have been made on two channel islands of Jersey and Guernsey. Those channel islands are some 80-odd miles from the coast of England, but they're only a few miles from the coast of Normandy. And from those islands, once we have established air bases on them, and that will not take long, we can strike either towards Brittany or towards Normandy, we will have comparatively secure air bases again because of our control of the sea from which we can strike in to the help of any particular detachment that may be in difficulties somewhere in the interior of Normandy. And the seizure of those islands is an important factor in the development of our offensive. A cross-channel bombardment began this morning from the area of Calais in the direction of Dover. You have heard of those tremendous long-range German guns that have been firing at intervals. They fired this morning for only 45 minutes. And then the Air Force that started from the British Isles and that went over the position of the guns and that soon located them by dropping their loads of bombs promptly silenced them. Here, as elsewhere, what we had thought of as secret German devices, as particular German ingenious mechanisms to prevent invasion, failed to come off. 
no secret weapon on the part of the Germans has so far been developed, at least none that we've had any inkling of. And we were surprised at the comparative lack of underwater obstructions when our barges approached the invasion coast. We managed to reach the coast with comparative ease and, so far as we are aware, with comparatively little loss. Our own secret weapon, the little one-man submarine, helped us tremendously because those little craft went across the channel last night and established markers so that every invasion barge, as it approached the French coast this morning, knew exactly where it was intended to land. The weather was with us. The moon was out. Conditions, so far as we know, were particularly favorable for our landing operations. The first German defenses, then, established along the coast, have evidently failed. The shore batteries, on which they counted so much, failed to stop our invasion barges. Why? Because those barges were covered by fighter planes to such an extent that those batteries, as soon as they opened up and revealed their positions, were promptly knocked out. That is, those that have not already been knocked out by that particularly heavy bombardment which has been concentrated on that Channel Coast now for several weeks past. <coughs> Our experiences in Africa and Sicily and Italy have proved invaluable in organizing today's invasion. Many Bitter lessons had to be learned. Fortunately, we have learned them. We have found ways to overcome the difficulties that developed during those early invasions when we were inexperienced and when our mechanized invasion material was not as good as it is today. You may have wondered why it took us so long to develop this invasion. The reason is the determination on the part of the Allied Command to make it as inexpensive as possible in human life. <clears throat> A bulletin has just come from Washington that tells us that President Roosevelt has called the High Command to the White House for a D-Day conference. He called into consultation the highest-ranking military and naval officials. That means Admiral King, General Marshall, General Arnold, among others. He will confer with them, and perhaps on the basis of what they tell him, he will give the nation some message, perhaps at his regular press conference today. This is not the only invasion. Remember that this is but a beginning. Yes, the Germans say we landed three paratroop divisions, but we have more than three paratroop divisions. We have only made a beginning. The great mass of the accumulated human and mechanized material that we have been piling up in the British Isles for the past year, all that has not yet begun to be landed. We have huge forces that are available for a landing in southern France, something that the King of Norway said this morning in speaking to his people suggested to me the possibility of an invasion of Norway. And so, on this great day, let us recognize that invasion has begun, but only one invasion, not the only one. Thanks to our patience, thanks to the long delay, thanks to the determination to save human life, we can now make invasion after invasion until they bring victory. Good morning. You have just heard an analysis of the latest reports from the invasion front brought to you by the Dean of American Commentators, NBC's H.B. Kaltenborn. The National Broadcasting Company will continue to bring you complete and full reports on the invasion as they come to us at the NBC newsroom here in New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Eleven fifteen a.m. Eastern War Time. W E A F, New York.
The National Broadcasting Company brings you a program of songs by Tommy Taylor. It had to be you. It had to be you. I wandered around, finally found somebody who could make me be true, could make me be blue, even be glad just to be sad thinking of you. Some others I've seen might never be me, might never be This is the National Broadcasting Company in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, we will bring you bulletins just as soon as they are made available. In the meantime, we invite you to listen to music by the NBC Orchestra. We suggest you stay tuned for later developments.
NBC Newsroom in New York, and here is Mr. H.V. Kaltenborn. A bulletin from London. Military observers said today that a general Russian offensive, coordinated with the Anglo-American attack from the West, may be launched within the next 48 hours, and almost certainly will begin before the weekend. That is exactly what the Germans have been expecting. That is why they launched their counteroffensive north of Jassy in Romania. That is why they have concentrated every possible military effort of which they were capable into developing that offensive into a major attack. In that attempt, they have failed. The Russians have now had some four weeks in which to marshal their forces, develop their transportation, prepare their troops for the next great effort on the Eastern Front. And in accordance with the decisions reached by the Allied Chiefs of State, at their meetings in Moscow and Tehran, that offensive was sure to be coordinated with the launching of our offensive in Western Europe. And so, before the week is out, the nutcracker driving against Hitler's forces from East and West will be in effect. Thank you, Mr. Carltonborn. We now return you to our regularly scheduled program by Tommy Taylor.
time, CBS World News will attempt to bring you a scheduled address to the people of France by General Charles de Gaulle, leader of the French Committee of National Liberation. General de Gaulle will speak from London, and if we are able to pick up his talk, you will hear a running translation of his address by Beverly Sturman of Columbia Shortwave News staff. This is CBS in New York, and in a few moments, we will switch you to London for the scheduled address of General Charles de Gaulle. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for the general to begin, we might mention that it was announced only this morning that he had arrived in Britain. As you know, his trip to England has been planned for some time, and he is scheduled to discuss at length with Prime Minister Churchill and other leaders the problems of his committee. High on the list of subjects to be discussed, it is commonly believed, is the question of whether General de Gaulle's Committee of Liberation is to be granted full or provisional recognition as the present government of France. At the present time, the Committee of Liberation does not enjoy the recognition already granted to exiled governments of other occupied nations, which now have their headquarters in London. The news bulletin this morning announcing de Gaulle's arrival in London also mentioned that he has already had a first meeting with Mr. Churchill shortly after the first news came of the invasion of his country by Allied troops. De Gaulle had apparently arrived some time before, but news of his presence in London had been held back for reasons of military security. We are still waiting for General de Gaulle to begin speaking in London. In the meanwhile, we'll bring you invasion news up to this moment. President Roosevelt summoned top Army and Navy chiefs to the White House today in Washington for an invasion conference, and he is preparing to lead the nation in a prayer which he wrote last night as the Allied Armada moved across the English Channel to France. Mr. Roosevelt called in General George C. Marshall, Army Chief of Staff, Admiral Ernest J. King, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet, and General Henry Arnold, Commander of the Army Air Forces. Meanwhile, reports are pouring into the White House from the War and Navy Department on the progress of the invasion. When the invasion came early today, President Roosevelt was sound asleep, and the White House was quiet except for a message center through which came official reports of last-minute developments. The president retired early in the evening after his radio broadcast, but undoubtedly was up early canvassing the latest official dispatches. After the landing in France was announced, members of the White House staff remained in close touch with their offices, and the workday was expected to begin an hour or two earlier. Otherwise, the White House was quiet, with very few lights on, and no activity except in the press room where a group of reporters sat through much of the night waiting for any possible development from the president. The contrast with that other climactic occasion, December 7th, 1941, was marked. News of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was disseminated from the White House with, as one reporter recalled, a flash a minute. This time, the White House seemed to be sleeping through the first phases of the action. Here's a late bulletin from London which says that more than 1,000 American heavy bombers attacked enemy targets in France this morning in support of the invasion. Military observers in London said today that a general Russian offensive coordinated with the Anglo-American attack from the West may be launched within the next 48 hours and almost certainly will begin before the weekend. News of the Allied landing in France spread swiftly throughout Russia today and touched off enthusiastic demonstrations such as rarely have been seen since the war began. American war correspondents in Moscow were the first to break the news and they were quickly surrounded by cheering crowds who rushed to shake their hands and to offer congratulations. Radio Moscow's chief announcer, who customarily reads only Premier Stalin's orders of the day, broadcasted General Dwight D. Eisenhower's special communique announcing the landing. He read the bulletin in a solemn and triumphant tone, rivaling his best performance for the Red Army's biggest victory announcement. Soviet war marches, Yankee Doodle, and the triumphal music reserved for Stalin's victory orders followed the bulletin. For two weeks now, the Russian people have been expecting the invasion to begin at any moment. And the question on everyone's lips was, has it started? The Soviet people now are waiting for their own armies to strike from the east in the coordinated offensive mapped out at the Tehran conference. The German Transocean News Agency said today that a battle was in progress in the English Channel north of La Havre between German naval units and Allied forces attempting to make a landing. Nazi broadcasters said the Allies had won footholds on several islands off the coast of France. Earlier, they reported landings in the Channel Islands west of the Norman Peninsula. That's the Normandy Peninsula. The Transocean Agency reported that a naval battle was going on in the Channel north of La Havre between German units and Allied forces trying to make a landing. 
DNB, the official Nazi agency, said German counterthrusts were being undertaken east of Cherbourg, but the enemy keeps throwing the bulk of his troops into the area between Cherbourg and Oostraham. The 28th and 101st American Parachute Divisions dropped in the Normandy area, DNB reported, adding the usual propaganda claim that many of these soldiers were captured. Ladies and gentlemen, this is CBS World News in New York. We had expected to bring you an address by General Charles de Gaulle speaking in London, but so far we've been unable to contact that point. Meanwhile, we're bringing you news of the invasion to bring you up to date on what has occurred in this biggest of all days, the invasion of Western Europe. An American war correspondent, Stanley Richardson, who has just returned from the Second Front beachhead with the first naval eyewitness of the operation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're informed that we can hear from General de Gaulle in London. So we switch you now to London for the address by General de Gaulle. En bon ordre. Pour nos armées de terre, de mer, de l'air, il n'y a point là de problème. Jamais elles ne furent plus ardentes, plus habiles, plus disciplinées. L'Afrique, l'Italie, l'océan et le ciel ont vu leur force et leur gloire renaissante. La terre natale les verra demain. Pour la nation... General de Gaulle says that never have France's forces of the air, sea, and land had such a glorious opportunity to distinguish themselves. And he speaks of the glories which the French armies have just uh, achieved in the Italian campaign. Soit exactement suivi. La seconde est que l'action menée par nous sur les arrières de l'ennemi soit conjuguée aussi étroitement que possible avec celle que mène de France les armées alliées. General de Gaulle says that the first order which he has to, which the French government has to give to the French forces uh, will be followed exactly de l'action des forces de la résistance doit durer pour aller sans plissant jusqu'au moment de la déroute allemande. La troisième condition est que tous ceux qui sont capables d'agir, soit par les armes, soit par les destructions, soit par le renseignement, General de Gaulle says that the action which the French armies will carry out with the, the Allies against the enemy will be exactly conjugated with those of the Allies. Ou à la déportation, quelles que soient les difficultés, tout vaut mieux. And with these actions, that of French resistance will also be combined. La de France a commencé. Il n'y a plus dans la nation dans l'Empire, dans les armées, qu'une seule et même volonté, qu'une seule et même espérance derrière le nuage. And General de Gaulle says it is absolutely necessary that all French patriots capable to act by arms and by refusing to work for the Germans should not allow themselves to be taken prisoner. Le français qui vous est parvenu de Londres Nous vous retournons au studio de la Voix de l'Amérique à New York. And General de Gaulle said in concluding that the Battle of France has begun and there is no longer except a single and, and uh, sole will to conquer on the part of the French nation. You have just heard a speech by General Charles de Gaulle and its translation, a running translation of that speech by Beverly Thurman of Columbia's shortwave news staff. General de Gaulle spoke to you from London. And now here in CBS World News headquarters in New York is Columbia's distinguished commentator, Mr. Quincy Howe.
The news of Allied landings on the north coast of France has given the war its most dramatic and sudden change since the Germans invaded Russia. Up to less than 12 hours ago, the Russians and the Russians alone had engaged and defeated millions of German troops in vast land battles. Our North African and Italian campaigns had diverted some German strength from Russia, so had our preparations for invasion from the West. The fall of Mussolini in July and the fall of Rome day before yesterday hit German prestige hard throughout Europe. But until Anglo-American troops began to land in force in the West, it was toward the Russians that the Germans looked with fear and the people of the occupied countries with hope. Our landings have started to change all that, and the better and faster our campaign in the West develops, the more rapidly British and American prestige will grow in Western Europe. These landings differ from the invasion of Italy in at least two important respects. First, they show that Britain and the United States have developed first-rate military power on land as well as in the sea and on the air. We are now able to come to grips with the Germans in their own element, land fighting, and have already mastered our two elements, the air and the sea. That was Columbia's analyst, Quincy Howe. Ladies and gentlemen, the following is the invasion prayer which President Roosevelt wrote while Allied troops were landing on the coast of France and which he will read to the nation by radio at 10 p.m. Eastern War Time tonight. My fellow Americans, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness to their faith. They will need thy blessing. Their road will be long and hard. The enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again, and we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. They will be sore tired by night and by day, without rest till the victory is won. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war. These are men lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. They yearn but for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, wives, sisters and brothers of brave men overseas, whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, help us, almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in thee in this hour of great sacrifice. Many people have urged that I call the nation into a single day of special prayer. But because the road is long and the desire is great, I ask that our people devote themselves in continuance of prayer. As we rise to each new day, and again when each day is spent, let words of prayer be on our lips, invoking thy help to our efforts. Give us strength, too, strength in our daily tasks to redouble the contributions we make in the physical and material support of our armed forces. And let our hearts be stout to wait out the long travel, to bear sorrows that may come, to impart our courage unto our sons wheresoever they may be. And, O Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other, faith in our united crusade. Let not the keenness of our spirit ever be dull. Let not the impacts of temporary events, of temporal matters, of but fleeting moments, let not these deter us in our unconquerable purpose. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogances. Lead us to the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. Thy will be done, almighty God. Amen. <laughs> Friends, the long-awaited D-Day is here. 
And in Littleton, as in thousands of other towns, hamlets, and cities throughout our country, the churches are open for prayer. Aunt Jenny herself has just returned and has been talking out by the front gate with Martha Reynolds, one of whose boys has been in England with the invasion forces. And here's Aunt Jenny now. Folks, you heard what Danny just said, and I guess there's not one of us that has someone near and dear in the service of our country. A husband, a son, a sweetheart. Or maybe the boy down the street who was just a kid only a few years ago. That's right. And whoever they are, wherever they are, our hearts are with them today. And our thoughts go out especially to the men and boys who are invading Europe to bring liberty to the starving, conquered people. And now the time's come that these oppressed nations have been looking forward to for so long. And ladies, it's up to us home folks to help our men and boys by keeping our faith in them strong and unwavering as they fight to stamp out the forces of evil and oppression. So now, friends, let's join in a brief prayer for the safety and success of our loved ones. Dear Heavenly Father, be with our boys today. They're fighting that liberty and right may prevail. Give them the strength that is beyond human strength. Sustain and comfort them. And grant that the light of victory may begin to shine in the not-too-distant future. And that our boys will come home to us again. Friends, for the sake of our dear ones in the service, let's all firmly resolve anew this day that we'll not relax our efforts, that we'll continue to do everything in our power to help win the war, to back up our brave fighting men and women. God bless them, every one. And now for your story, Aunt Jenny. Well, friends, you remember Claire Rogers was just like a daughter to old Anthony Abbott before he died? His only son, Jim, had run away from home years ago after an auto accident. And then Jim came back to Littleton, not knowing his father was dead. That's right, Danny. Martha Reynolds told him she was at the traveler's aid desk that morning. She told him, too, that he'd inherited some money. But as she didn't know the name of his father's lawyer, she told him to go down to the newspaper office and talk to Calvin. Well, early that afternoon... Jim went to the clarion office to get a copy of the newspaper carrying the notice of his father's death. And then Calvin was saying... I was just going home for a bite of lunch, Mr. Abbott. Uh, Glad to share it with you. Well, that's uh, very kind of you, Mr. Wheeler, but I haven't time today. Oh, that's too bad. Here's the paper, Mr. Wheeler. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Pete. The article about Mr. Abbott is on the front page, along with the pictures, boss. Ah, good. Why does Pete say that? I mean, how did he know that I wanted to see the article about Mr. Abbott? Oh, people around the newspaper office have a way of putting one or two together. <laughs> we don't always get the right answer. Sometimes we learn too late to our sorrow, and but... Uh... You and Pete recognize me, too. Yes, yes. I'd like to help you in any way I can, Mr. Abbott. Well, thank you. But I'm not at all sure I'll stay here, and I had in mind slipping away with as little commotion as possible. Uh, no explanation is necessary. If you don't find what you want in the paper, just let me know. I... I decided I couldn't leave without going to my father's attorney. It was his name that I wanted to get from the paper without asking anyone for it directly. Oh, I understand. Well, I'll tell you, he's Will Hunter. His office is two blocks down the street on the right-hand side in the yellow brick building in the center of the block. Thank you. Thank you very much, and goodbye, sir. Goodbye, and good luck, Jim. You said it, boss. Good luck. That guy sure looks like he could stand a little luck. Yes, yes, he does, Pete. Can you see through a drip like that? Being the son of good old Anthony Abbott, inheriting all that dough, and looking like such a sourpuss about it. Or was it an act, a cover-up, a fear to show how gosh your fire tickly was when nice old guy had kicked off? I don't believe I saw Jim Abbott just like you did, Pete. His eyes were as gentle as a woman's. No, 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 not, that's not it. Uh, they were... Yeah, I know, boss. They looked like if he was a girl, he'd have been blubbering fit to drown us. And if it was an act, he can sure deliver the goods, costume and all. Boy, that suit's so thin that if he had sneezed real hard, it'd have been gone with the wind. Hunter, I'm Jim Abbott. Well, uh, well, how do you do? This is indeed a surprise. Do sit down, Mr. Abbott. Thank you. I probably should have notified you that I was coming, but I... Didn't know that I was myself until about an hour ago. You've been in town only an hour, Mr. Abbott, or may I call you Jim? If you like. 
But about coming in town, I I came in on an early train this morning, but... Oh, I see. You mean that you only learned within the hour of your father's uh, demise and the legacy he left you? No, I, I learned of that soon after I arrived. Oh, I see. It took me some time to decide whether or not I wanted to make any inquiry about the money I was told my father had left me. May I ask why you would have to uh, decide on such a matter, Mr. Abbott? Well, I think it's only fair to tell you that I still haven't made up my mind as to, to what I'll do in regard to it, but I would like very much to find out what my father's last wishes were and ask if he perhaps left any personal message for me. Yes, Mr. Abbott, there's a letter, but I do not have it in my possession. Well, where is it? Who has it? A girl by the name of Claire Rogers has it. She came in after her work every day and cared for your father, and he loved her like a daughter. Well, this girl was a nurse? No, it seems your father befriended her when she came here some six or seven years ago, and Claire never forgot it. Oh, I see. Now, as to the terms of the will, you are to receive a certain sum each month for the first year. The sum isn't large, but it'll be sufficient for your personal needs. Well, I wasn't thinking of my current needs, Mr. Hunter. I'm able to manage. What I want is my father's letter to me. Of course. I'll call Claire after her work and tell her you're coming for it. But first, I want to make the other terms of the will clear to you. Very well, sir. Briefly, they are this. After the year is up, you are to be given full possession of your father's entire legacy. Well, I, I don't know that I'd feel right in taking it after the way I've... In this matter, you do not have only yourself to consider, Jim. As the will, including your monthly allotment, is null and void, unless you agree within two weeks' time to a certain stipulation your father has made. Stipulation? But well, that doesn't sound like my father. But since he made it, he must have felt he had some good reason for it. And I couldn't blame him if he'd lost all faith in me. His faith in you, Jim, never wavered. And the stipulation is that you marry Claire Rogers. Marry? Marry? Yes. Marry the girl who cared for your father so long. Oh, but, but see here... The kind of a girl I'd want to marry wouldn't be the kind of a girl who, who, who'd have me. I believe you'll regret having said that when you meet Claire Rogers. I regret having said it now. I regret ever having to, to think such a thing about any girl or about myself. But, but look at me. Shabby, lame. I'd be a pretty poor bet for any girl, even with the money, if I had to be thrown in along with it. What you're really trying to say, Jim, is that any girl who would marry you would be marrying just for the money. Isn't that it? Well, wouldn't she? Wouldn't she? What other reason could a girl who... who Oh, never mind. Please tell Claire Rogers that I'll not impose on her. And that if she'll send me my letter, we'll call it quit. What does she know about the stipulation? Yes, she knows. And wait a minute, Jim. You better think this over a little. Claire cared for your father without thought of return for herself. Well, that sounds very pretty. But if you'd knocked around the world as much as I have, you'd know that those things just don't happen without a motive behind them. Again, I say, you'll regret those words when you meet Claire. Mr. Hunter, you may think you can tell by by looking at me, what my life has been. Only, you can't. I mean, there are certain things that I still have ideals about. Jim, it was your father's last wish expressed to me that I would promise him not to let you bolt without meeting and talking with Claire. Now, you wouldn't refuse your father's last wish just to talk with her, would you, Jim? No. No, I guess I, I couldn't do that. Good. I'll take you to. No, 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 thank you. If I must see her, I, I want to do it alone. <laughs> I've been here two hours, and we've talked about everything except what I came to talk to you about. I'd like it much better if you'd call me Claire. You see, I've known you for such a long, long time, Jim, through your father that... Well, please call me Claire. And let's not talk about anything that disturbs you this afternoon. I'm sure there are still other things that you want me to tell you about your father. You've been very thoughtful to tell me all the things you have, Oh, but... I'll remember lots more as time goes along. Do you mind if I ask you something? No. You went to the cemetery this morning, as soon as you found out about your father, didn't you? Well, how did you know? Because there were fresh flowers there. When I went on my weekly visit this afternoon after work. You mean that you... you take flowers out to him every week? He loves flowers, Jim. Somehow I believe you do too, don't you? Why, I... I mean, I saw you looking at the sweet peas there on the desk. They're out of the garden. My landlady lets us rumors plant things in. Look, all this this talk, don't do it. I, I'm pretty well washed up, and I, I don't take this sympathy very well. Oh, Jim, what a word to use between us. Us? Well, that sounds as though you had already accepted the, uh, the stipulation my father made for us to, to marry. 
Well, I have. Without ever having seen me? Why? Well, Jim, maybe I can answer that better by saying that now that I have seen you, you're just as I thought you'd be from what your father told me of you. Just as fine, just as sensitive, and just as lost. All right. If that's the way you want it, and the money means enough to you to take it, even if you have to have me thrown in with it, I guess you've earned it. Oh, Jim. I'll call you tomorrow and make arrangements for the wedding. to marry Jim because of his inheritance, Aunt Jenny? Well, Danny, when a girl's had to work hard for years, money can make a big difference. But don't you go jump to the conclusion. You listen next time. Because right now, I want to appeal to all you wives and mothers. In times of anxiety, you are the one the whole family looks to for hope and strength. That's right. So even though it may be difficult, I'm appealing to you to be as strong and cheerful and matter-of-fact as possible. True names are never used in Spry's real-life stories, brought to you by S-P-R-Y. Fry, the improved all vegetable shortening. Dan Seymour speaking. last twice as long with Lux Care. Get extra wear from every pair with Lux Care. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Gentlemen, <clears throat> at this time, the National Broadcasting Company is pleased to present another prayer in the busy schedule of this historic day. We are pleased to introduce Mr. DeWitt A. Davidson, past first reader of the Second Church Christ Scientist in New York. Mr. Davidson. Pray for the prosperity of our country and for her victory under arms that justice, mercy, and peace continue to characterize her government and that they shall rule all nations. Pray that the divine presence may still guide and bless our chief magistrate, those associated with his executive trust, and our national judiciary. Give to our Congress wisdom and uphold our nation with the right arm of his righteousness. In your peaceful homes, remember our brave soldiers, whether in camp or in battle. Oh, may their love of country and their faithful service thereof be unto them life preservers. May our Father, Mother God, who in times past hath spread for us a table in the wilderness and in the midst of our enemies, Establish us in the most holy faith. Plant our feet firmly on truth, the rock of Christ, the substance of things hoped for, and fill us 
with the life and understanding of God and good will towards men. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard a prayer read by Mr. DeWitt A. Davidson, past first reader of Second Church Christ Scientist in New York. This is Don Goddard in the NBC Newsroom in New York with the latest summary of the invasion news. At this hour, there is every evidence that the armies of General Eisenhower, with the support of the Allied fleets and air forces, actually are expanding their beachheads on the coasts of France. From present descriptions, that beachhead, or that series of beachheads, is roughly a crescent of land swinging from the port of Cherbourg eastward to the port of Le Havre, around the estuary of the River Seine where it joins the waters of the Channel. At last reports, this beachhead was about ten miles wide at its widest place at the spot of greatest attack, the city of Caen. There are German reports that the Allies also have landed on the Channel Islands of Jersey and Guernsey, but those reports are unconfirmed at this hour. An earlier Swedish report said that our points of landing numbered about twelve. This has not been confirmed either. The Germans, just heard by our monitors at NBC, also say that they expect new landings on the island of San Malo, another of the Channel Islands. And the latest report from our reconnaissance flyers, who already are piecing together several thousand pictures of the beachheads and producing evidence that our armies have secured their positions, are now in. And a bulletin at an Allied air base in England says that many Allied assault troops are now beyond the initial danger zone of total exposure in France. That also is a report from our reconnaissance flyers. The soldiers of the Allied nations have been on the shores of Europe for 12 hours and more now, and the Germans are beginning to come back with counter-assault at our beachheads. Just how heavy or how effective those counter-blows are is not clear. The Germans, in one breath, speak of meeting our armies along the whole 70 miles of French coastline, where we've secured ourselves. They speak of dealing effectively with our parachutists, and they say they've taken many of them prisoner. They also say their big coastal guns have come into play, and their fleets of fast e-boats and destroyers are in the Seine estuaries battling our navies. They claim they have sunk a cruiser and several landing barges. They are claiming no air successes to this point, however. They make these claims when at last they announced, after nine hours of double talk on their domestic radio programs to the German people, that this really looked like the invasion the Allies had been talking about. And then they began to explain how many ships and planes and men we'd thrown into the fray. They even admitted that we'd penetrated rather far inland, and a distance of ten or twelve miles, they said. The Nazis undoubtedly are readying their counterattacks. They may actually have launched some. But thus far, considering the magnitude of their operations, the number of men and the 4,000 ships and 11,000 Allied planes involved, our casualties have been comparatively light. That is an official statement, and in most places our men came ashore against little opposition, and the German Air Force was practically absent. In fact, our reconnaissance flyers report that we not only have secured our beachheads, but that some of our advanced spearheads are now penetrating southward, and they say, on the run. If they are, they're headed in the general direction of Paris, which lies only 125 miles to the south. A bulletin from London. German fighter planes have begun offering opposition now to Allied invasion forces. That's just in. Returning Allied pilots, uh, pilots report numerous dogfights between Allied typhoons and German Messerschmitts and Fokker Wolfs in the southeast battle area of the invasion coast. One of the contributing factors in our initial successes there on the northern shores of France, undoubtedly, is our overwhelming superiority in air power. Air power to the smothering point. 11,000 planes in action today as our troops swept ashore. So Prime Minister Churchill told the House of Commons this morning. And that, that add that to the accumulated death and destruction from thousands upon thousands of sorties of our air blitz to date. Also, that concentrated attack, the heaviest yet in a limited area that the RAF laid on the path to invasion that our armies were to take a few hours after last night. Add another thousand plane attack by American heavy bombers along that coast this morning, and then add the hundreds to come. A bulletin from Stockholm, a Berlin dispatch of the Scandinavian Telegraph Bureau, reports heavy fighting on both sides of Caen today, and says additional Allied invasion forces have been seen off Caen and off Cherbourg, undoubtedly reinforcements now being brought up. Yes, the Germans will react militarily, as they did at Anzio, bitterly and with strength. Few observers doubt that at this hour. But we're ashore on the continent of Europe, and we shall stay there. 
There seems little doubt of that either. One German reaction is that of Hitler himself. He was reported to be rushing to France today to try his intuition against the masterly planning of General Eisenhower and his commanders. Another bulletin from Washington, Admiral Royal E. Ingersoll has just now officially revealed that U.S. battleships, cruisers, and destroyers of the United States Navy are participating in the invasion of Western Europe. The news of the invasion in Western Europe gave an added impetus to our armies in Italy. Rome went wild with jubilation. A dispatch just received from Rome says that Allied troops have smashed five miles north of the Tiber River now. Sixteen miles east of Rome, Allied troops have captured a spot known as Tivoli Junction. To the west of the Holy City, near the mouth of the Tiber, American forces have cut off and captured a force of 2,000 Germans. And there are more reports that the enemy is bewildered, demoralized in their mad scramble northward. The armies of General Alexander are sweeping ahead along a front of 70 miles there in Italy and well north of Rome now. A late report from Washington, Soviet Ambassador Andrei A. Gromyko hails the opening of what he calls the Second Front, which Russia has so long demanded, and he predicts a speedy and a complete victory. In the first official Soviet reaction to the invasion news, the ambassador declares that he is confident that the combined blows of the powerful Allied coalition will ensure a speedy and complete victory over the enemy. The news of the invasion, he says, is good and encouraging. Gromyko conveys the wishes of the Soviet people for all successes to our allies in this most important military undertaking, which is speeding up our common victory over the mortal enemy of mankind, Hitlerite Germany. And London war authorities have heard this morning that Russia herself is now about ready to strike the Germans in great strength from the east and will launch major offensives before this week is over. And President Roosevelt has just summoned the top leaders, the chiefs of his army and the navy and the air forces for a conference at the White House. And this afternoon he will meet the newsmen for his regular Tuesday afternoon noon news conference. And I understand that we are now to have a special broadcast from Rome, a special broadcast which will be heard from, uh, from the city of London, rather, from our headquarters in London. If London is ready, we will call them in. They will be ready in just a moment. We understand that uh, one of our reporters is waiting over there, having just conferred with top leaders of the Allied armies. Go ahead, London. This is W.W. Chaplin in London. The first post-invasion press conference has just been held in a long, narrow, bowling alley sort of room in the Ministry of Information. And do you know one startling thing that has come out of that conference? Well, sir, the invasion of Europe from the West was originally planned for yesterday, not today. But the weather prophets came along and shook their fingers and wagged their heads, and they said, no, no, you can't have your invasion then, because the weather is going to be just awful. So, the generals took that dictum and they said, okay, they'd put off the invasion. The greatest amphibious operation in history, at least one day. And then what happened? Well, the next day, and that was yesterday, the weather was worse than ever. But, those old weather prophets came barging out again and said... Sure, it looks pretty terrible right now, but it's going to clear up fine. So the generals decided to let her go for last night, or rather early this morning. And sure enough, the weather cleared up and over they went. At this first press conference, sponsored by Shafe, which means Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, there were representatives of air, sea, and land forces. Nationality didn't count, as it doesn't count in the actual military operations. Some of the men talking today were American and some were British, just as some of the men doing the fighting are American and some are British. And now, back to the newsroom in New York. Thank you, Bill Chaplin. That was Bill Chaplin from our headquarters in London telling us the latest invasion news in London. As he told you, the Allied landings in France were postponed 24 hours due to bad weather. That was learned today at Allied headquarters, and Bill has just been up there talking with the Supreme Commanders. And back here in this country, from every city and town in America today, 
The news is almost the same. There is relief that the tension is over, that D-Day has come at last, and the first reports are almost unbelievably favorable. But that relief is a sober relief, and if any joy is felt, it's tempered by the knowledge that American boys must die to liberate Europe in this greatest invasion which the world has ever seen. That's the temper and the spirit of America today as we feel it here in the newsroom, as we get it from the dispatches which are pouring in by the thousands of words here at NBC, describing the reaction in all communities, big and little, of the United States and of the world. But at least the waiting is over, and Americans have looked at each other and said, yes, this is it. And they could take some comfort from the words of Winston Churchill, that grand old phrase maker this morning, who told the House of Commons this morning that things were going according to plan, and he added, what a plan that is. Said Churchill, sighting the 4,000 ships and 11,000 planes, and our beachheads already driven into the Normandy Peninsula of France, yes. What a plan. And we could take comfort, too, from the knowledge that President Roosevelt sat up all night behind blacked-out windows of the White House, in constant touch with the situation, knowing when every naval vessel was launched, when every amphibious landing barge sheared onto the beaches of France. America's, the Americans could take comfort in the fact that the President was praying along with them, and that he was composing a prayer, too, as soon as he finished his radio address last night, which he will ask Americans to intone with him when he speaks again tonight on the radio at 10 o'clock Eastern Wartime. The President's Secretary, Stephen Early, told this story to reporters in Washington this morning. He knew when the first barges started across the channel, and he knew when they landed. He knew of other operations in just as great detail. And that prayer, which President Roosevelt has composed, has been released for publication this afternoon in order that the public may be familiar with it and be able to join in with the President. And in part, it goes like this. My fellow Americans, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of the nation, this day have set up a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness to their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. And that is the NBC Newsroom in New York. This is Don Goddard speaking for NBC. We pause briefly for station identification. WEAF, New York. He now continues its full and complete coverage of the invasion. Here is Caesar Searchinger with his report on the news behind the news of the invasion to the moment. Mr. Searchinger. Good afternoon. I've uh, got a new a, uh, bulletin in just now which says, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, German opposition in all quarters was less than expected. It was learned at headquarters tonight, and an optimistic tone was evident. There's another bulletin which says that American warships, particularly one battleship, moved close in to the French shore and with the help of the Air Forces, virtually silenced the coastal guns of the landing beaches. Now, that's a very interesting story, because one of the things that we always wondered about was what the coastal batteries would do to warships going in close to shore. The, the Germans have long told us about their terrific batteries, their terrific Atlantic wall that nothing could approach. Well, as a matter of fact, we did know... Uh, that the guns which manned that Atlantic war were largely guns taken from the French and from the Belgians. A good many of them came from the Maginot Line. And uh, the largest guns, stationary guns on the coast there, were 11 inches, from 6 to 11 inches. Now you can see, of course, that they do not stack up against the uh, 11 to 16 inch guns of uh, battleships and cruisers. And the concentration on one of our cruisers is much greater than the Germans can put on, say, several miles of coast, unless they covered the whole down coast from, uh, for a thousand miles with guns which sim simply do not exist. So that uh, the prognostications which we made some time ago about the strength of the German coastal batteries have come pretty well true. Uh, what, of course, is, we do not know yet is what really... Uh, happened on the beaches, and many things did happen, undoubtedly. We won't go into details now. We do know that 
as from the reports we have, that the Allies did crash the beaches, that they did get through the mines, that they did get through the mortars and the machine gun nests, and they must have got past a good many of the pillboxes, and they are well inland. And, of course, we also know that our paratroopers went behind the lines and are attacking the fortifications from the other side. The big show, of course, will come further inland, may not come for some time, because it will come in the area which is uh, the fortifications in depth which provide for a large area for maneuvering and for an army of considerable size to be brought there over the railway lines that may be left. But we do know that not much is left of the railway net behind Harbour or any of the Channel Coasts. And that is, of course, the real uh, secret of our success, such as it is so far. Now, when the Allies invaded this morning, if we cast our eyes back a little bit over recent history, it is uh, the last of a string of events that really ought to fill our hearts with pride. We go back to Pearl Harbor... 1941, December 7th. That was the beginning of it for us. For a year, nothing very much happened so far as we are concerned. But in October, in October 23rd, 1942, there was that Battle of El Alamein that broke the line, that broke the, the Rommel, Rommel's defense in Africa. And it was followed by this tremendous thousand-mile retreat across North Africa. In, uh, in November 8th, the Allies invaded North Africa with the greatest armada ever seen. On January 26th of 1943, the British took Tripoli, and in February 2nd, there was the victory at Stalingrad, the real turning point of the war, when the, the siege of Stalingrad was lifted. Well, the Battle of Europe proper, so far as we are concerned, began in July. On July 10th, the largest invasion, invasion force in history landed at Sicily. On July 25th, Mussolini fell, and on September 3rd, we invaded Italy. On sept September 8th, Italy surrendered, and then came that terrible Battle of Salerno, which was our first real experience in landing on a defended coast in Europe. It was a success, and Salerno proved... Uh, proved the forerunner of what has happened this morning, the invasion of Western Europe. Well, to go a little further, on October 31, the leaders met at Moscow and planned the whole campaign, and at Tehran it was confirmed in November 26. General Eisenhower already was in London taking charge, and since then the organization of the greatest invasion of all history has taken place. Then, of course, I should mention that six weeks ago the casino offensive uh, opened and on June 4th, two days ago, came the fall of Rome. Who would have thought on that day that only a day later, two days later, would come the great news that we've all been waiting for. You may remember that on Saturday there was some false news. By some mistake, we were told that the invasion had already started. And then it had to be denied. I happened to be on the air just after that, and I called your attention to the fact that it happened to be the anniversary of Dunkirk, of that terrific battle on the beaches of Dunkirk when the British evacuated their army of 300,000 men, which in a way was also a turning point of the war and perhaps the day that saved civilization more than any other one day. Well, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the invasion coast. We don't know officially from the Allies where we have landed. The Germans say we have landed at Le Havre, and I've heard as many as 11 other points mentioned. Well, anywhere from Holland down to the end of Normandy is invasion coast. Calais, as you know, is the part of the coast that was most hardly hit by uh, the invasion bombardment, the air bombardment, which went on continuously for months and months. Well, Calais is also the place, the only place, where Europe was invaded across the Channel before. In 1347, over five centuries ago, the British landed near Calais and fought the Battle of Tracy, and uh, then held Calais for 200 years. 
Europe was not invaded again from the West until 1809, when uh, the British landed near Flushing on the Dutch coast against Napoleon. But that invasion was decidedly not a success. The British couldn't even take Antwerp, and they had to leave again. Indeed, this is a historic day, for Europe has never been invaded in force from the West, or for that matter, from any part against a really defended coast. So this is really something that has never happened in history before. <clears throat> now, as I said before, the crisis will not come immediately. The crisis will come inland. That is what this general has warned us about for some time. It will come after the Germans have discovered the main centers of our attack and have moved into their reserves and are ready to counterattack us in force. To delay and interfere with the assembling of a counterattacking army is therefore the next problem we have to deal with. The constant bombing of railroad centers along the western coasts during the past weeks and months was, in fact, the first stage of that tackling that problem. This will be followed by intensive tactical bombing of the transportation system as we go along. Of course, the, one of the remarkable things is that we did not meet more uh, opposition from fighters in the air. We had a tremendous cover, we can be sure of that, an uh, umbrella of fighters the whole time but apparently the Germans did not come up. And that seems to confirm the suspicion that the German fighter force has been very badly de depleted. And, of course, that, in fact, gave us the cue as to when the invasion should take place. Then, of course, there is the employment of paratroops. That probably is taking place to an extent that has never taken place before. The Germans themselves reported that we had 80,000 of these troops in England ready for the invasion jump. This parachute corps will have the most difficult job of all. They'll be expected not only to dynamite road bridges and take uh, railroad junctions, but attack Nazi fortifications from the rear. If we have mastery in the air, and it seems that we will have from now on, the number of these troops can be increased almost at will. They'll have no heavier to artillery, but the Germans themselves have shown how fortifications can be taken by sappers armed with hand grenades and dynamite. In 1940, you may remember, they took the famous uh, Fort Emile in Belgium, and that was supposed to be impregnable with a loss of only seven men. Now, the first real test of the invasion will come when we are perhaps 20 or more miles inland, that is, beyond the range of our naval guns. Assuming that Rommel will have had time to assemble his field army, it will be a test that we have not met before, either in Sicily or at Salon, San Salerno. And, uh, of course, the best, the more nearest test was at Salerno and at the Anzio beachhead, which now is no longer a beachhead, but part of the triumphant army that has entered Rome. Now, there doesn't seem to be anything later than I've already told you, because the uh, Allies are keeping mum on what's happened. All that we know is uh, what the Germans tell us. But we might tell you a little bit about what the Germans' prospects are of holding back our invasion. The Germans have made a great deal of the theory of the interior lines. They say that they have the advantage in the fortress Europe because they have the interior lines. He who operates on interior lines, of course, has an important asset. Uh, but consequently, the idea that Germany's central position in relation to our opponents will be an intrinsic advantage in the coming struggle uh, seems to be general. Well, uh, it's obvious that in most cases, a military machine, which can radiate its power from a central reservoir to the circumference, switching its principal concentration to given points at will, is in a superior position to its opponents. The latter must diffuse their resources among, so to say, a ring of reservoirs. Instead of using a radius, they can only swing their power from one point to another by following the long curve of the circumference. Allied aid to Russia goes all the way around by the Arctic or through Persia. 
It's a matter of elementary geometry. But this proposition is not always true and under all conditions. If a centrally situated antagonist enjoys overall superiority in weight, he can bring power to bear wherever he chooses and so demolish his opponents piecemeal. If he is approximately equal to them in weight, interior lines are still a substantial advantage because he can affect any necessary concentration more rapidly. But what if he is inferior in numbers, in air and sea power? In that situation, the fact that he is inside a circumference, which he must maintain, is a deadly disadvantage because he is pinned down at every point on the circle, whereas his opponents are free to exploit the latest advantages of exterior lines by hitting everywhere at once, if they so choose. That is the position of Germany and the Allies, respectively, today. A bulletin has just been handed to me to the effect that General William Hanstein, Commander-in-Chief of the Norwegian Underground, broadcast an order to all organized fighting groups inside Norway today to be prepared to take part in the Great Settlement. Hanstein told his uh, countrymen that they would receive orders on what to do. You must not act openly except in conjunction with the Allied military plan and not before orders have been issued from here. That would seem to indicate that we might have an invasion in Norway as well as in France. It also opens the question of all the other undergrounds along the invasion coast and particularly the French underground. What is the French underground doing? And what have the Allies done to encourage the French underground and to beyond the instructions given by Eisenhower to organize themselves and uh, go to bat. Now, there's one little fly in the ointment, and so far as we know as yet, there has been no agreement made with General de Gaulle about the underground, the disposition of the underground, and the uh, and what is to be done about the government of France in the rear of the invasion. However, it is reported that General de Gaulle is in London now, and we hope that this problem may also be solved before long. Good afternoon. We announce a special feature of the NBC coverage of the invasion. Tonight at 8.30 over station WNBT, NBC television will bring you a program featuring H.V. Kaltenborn and a special Signal, signal Corps pre-invasion film, WEAF, New York. From our NBC newsroom in New York, we take you now to NBC in Washington. This is Morgan Beatty speaking to you from the radio gallery of the United States Senate in Washington, where it's not exactly business as usual today, although there is a familiar routine in the air. A few moments ago, the presidential buzzer rang, denoting a list of nominations to public office, nominations that are not news on a day like D-Day. The House convened first at 11 o'clock. Instead of the usual prayer, the members themselves stood with heads bowed in silent prayer. Out in the House corridor, they carefully prepared maps of Colonel Lawrence Martin of the Library of Congress for the center of attention. Groups of representatives discussed the invasion, even as you and I. And one representative noticed the direct route to Paris ahead of our forces and said, wouldn't it be fine if they could move right into the capital of France? Speaker Rayburn stopped me on the way over to the Senate gallery to say he couldn't be with us as he had hoped. He has a luncheon date with the president today. Here in the Senate, the Senate, uh, the session opened at noon, just about a half hour ago, but most senators were in committee meetings. Not more than a handful were on the floor. And for the first time in many a moon, the Senate chaplain, Dr. Frederick Brown Harris, did not have his opening prayer all typed out in advance for the reporters. He spent much more time than the regular period preparing today's message. Here is part of his prayer. We pray today, he said, this day of days for our enemies with calloused hearts and warped minds and poisoned conceptions. Forgive them. They know not what they do. Bring them to last with purred spirits in the united family of nations. And now, ladies and gentlemen, there are several senators and representatives with us today, and the first of them is Senator Bennett Clark of Missouri, a veteran of the last war, you may remember. He spends most of his time these days working on veterans' legislation, legislation for the men who today are going ashore in Europe on the greatest invasion effort of all time. 
Senator Clark, you know, is author of the G.I. Bill of Rights, now in the Senate. And while a soldier, incidentally, you may remember that he and Teddy Roosevelt Jr. organized the American Legion. Won't you tell us something about that, Senator Clark, and give us some message for today? Mr. Brady, in this moment of destiny, when our boys are jumping off in the greatest military adventure of all time, the American people may have the satisfaction of knowing that our Army comprises the best trained, the best equipped, best armed, best fed, and the best clothed Army that the United States has ever sent into action. I know we're all glad of that, Senator. Thank you very much, sir. And now I see Congresswoman Claire Booth Luce of Connecticut. She's wearing that new hairdo, by the way, the one with the braids. Mrs. Luce, would you say something for us today? This is the hour that marks the beginning of the battle for the world. We know that this is the true name for the battle, for if we were to lose it, we'd lose our supreme chance to lead in the councils of peace and to guide our nations towards a brighter destiny. We will win this battle for the world. There's no one in our nation who doubts it, because we know that our arms are strong and our hearts are firm, and there is faith in our souls. In this moment of faith and victory for our arms, I find myself thinking not so much of our men who have crossed the channel or who are still to cross. I'm thinking of the mothers and fathers and wives who wait and listen and listen and wait at home. How heavy and cold is the fear in each heart for the dear one. How time drags and crawls and creeps and yet will not stand still until some news of him of that one boy, of that one man comes to you. A mother or a father mm -hmm. or a woman in love dies a thousand deaths a day waiting and listening. The other women have known the cruel pain of that long vigil that now faces you. They can only tell you this, believe in God, accept his will with love. Your man's fighting well for his country, his weapons are of the best, his leaders in the field are tough and wise, and the one thing that he would want is for you at home to be of good cheer so that you, in your courage, may set as fine an example as he is setting among his own comrades today in arms. Thank you, Mrs. Luce. Yours is the honor of interpreting for all of us the reactions of mothers throughout the United States. Now, I wanted to Senator Alban Barkley of Kentucky, who has sons in this war, would speak a word to you today. I'm sure that everybody in the United States, if not everybody in the world, has been thrilled this morning by the news of our invasion of Europe. I feel sure that all of the impatience which may have been exhibited prior to this date will fade when we consider that it has been the duty of our government and of our allied governments to prepare for this invasion to the last man, the last tank, the last airplane, the last round of ammunition in order that when we made the adventure, we should go forward in it. I can only say, as I feel the same suspense that must be felt by millions of parents all over the United States, we should fervently and devoutly pray, deep down in our hearts, that the God of justice and of peace may bring victory to our troops and to those of our allies at the earliest possible moment. And I might conclude this brief comment by quoting from an old church hymnal which I learned when I was a boy. This is the hour I long have sought and mourned because I found it not. Thank you, Senator Barkley. I myself, a veteran of many years on the Hill, not as many as you, of course, have seen this spirit of prayer among the representatives and senators of our nation. It's one of the most inspiring hours of my career on, on the Hill at any rate. And now... Senator White of Maine, the minority leader, the leader for the Republicans, the opposition on Capitol Hill on the Senate side. Senator, would you say a word for us today? Mr. Brady, 
This is one of the momentous days in the world's history. It is shadowed with a possibility of disaster, but it has within it the substantial promise of a glorious ending. Wherever the men and the women of our country may be this day, they fight, they work, and they pray for victory, for justice, for peace, with all the blessings which these will bring to the peoples of the earth. We have abiding faith that in his appointed time, the God of battles and the God of peace will give triumphant victory to the right and will worst the forces of evil. Thank you, Senator White of Maine. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be interested to know that our guests here today, most of them are speaking to you right out of their hearts and minds. They haven't prepared anything. They've just come by the Senate Radio Gallery to speak a word at our request. And now... Senator Lester Hill of Alabama, who you may know is a war veteran and has long been head of the uh, House Military Committee in years gone by. Senator Hill. Our invasion constitutes the most stupendous military task ever undertaken in all the history of the world. It's not possible for us today to know the infinite preparation the careful and detailed plans that have been made for this invasion. Senator, may I interrupt with a yes. bulletin at this time? Sure. Go ahead, Mr. We Mr. have a bulletin from Supreme Allied Headquarters, Expeditionary Force. It says, our forces have, by evening of this day, gotten over the first five or six hurdles in the greatest amphibious assault of all time. Now, Senator Hill again. This is good news that we've made such progress. We can be thankful that we have made such progress, but we must all be prepared for terrific counterattacks that will be made by the Germans. I was speaking of the plans that have been made, the infinite preparation for this invasion. We can't know these plans now, but I think as a member of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs, I can say to the mothers and fathers of our young men and young women who are struggling on the beaches today, that our military and naval commanders have taken every possible precaution, have done everything humanly possible to protect and save every life they can, to keep whole every body that they can. Today we salute these heroic young men and young women. And for us it should be an hour of dedication, an hour in which we dedicate ourselves to the one thought and the one purpose that we here at home will do that which will best support, best sustain, and best back up these heroic young men and young women. And that we will also resolve that we will play our part in the building of a peace so that the sacrifices that our young men and young women are making today will not be made in vain. Thank you, Senator Hill of Alabama. We've now heard from several of our representatives on the Hill and our senators. The important message, I think, that all of them gave us, the main thing they stressed is the fact that America goes into this war prepared. I think all of them, pardonably, must be thanked for the effort they made to be sure that the armed services got everything they asked for in the war effort in the last two years. Never before in history has so much money been given to the Army and the Navy. Never has so much cooperation and unified spirit moved the efforts of Congress despite many, many arguments on the sidelines as time went on. Today we've heard Congresswoman Claire Booth Luce speaking for the mothers of the nation, speaking the message that they would have, most of them, if they were here with us today. And now... We have a bulletin from London. It says that Hermann Goering has issued an order of the day to the German air forces that the invasion of Western Europe must be fought off, even if it means the death of the Luftwaffe. Ladies and gentlemen, that would seem to be the beginning of preparations for the German counterattack. As Senator Hill told us a few moments ago, we must be prepared for terrific counterattacks by the Germans. They have not yet launched any such attacks. As a matter of fact, most of the congressmen and the senators I've talked to this morning have said, oh, how well it would be if we could only expect them to move right on in there. But we all know it can't be that way. 
The counterattack is a thing that's coming, and the counterattack in this particular zone of Europe, where the Germans are much closer to supply lines than we are, have not the hurdle of water to cross. That counterattack must be expected. That's why most of the men who spoke to you this morning, who know their map of Europe, who studied specially the strategy of this situation in the European area, they know that great losses are ahead of us in the next few moments. That's all for now from the Capitol in Washington. We return you just a moment, just a moment. We have a bulletin from London. Kenneth Banghart with a new bulletin. A bulletin from the NBC newsroom in Washington. It's just been announced in London by Prime Minister Winston Churchill that uh, Allied troops have penetrated several miles inland at some points after landings on the French coast. And now we return you to the NBC newsroom in New York. Back in the NBC newsroom in New York, and here is Don Goddard with more news flashes. Winston Churchill has just made a second appearance before the House of Commons in London, and he has had this to say about the events of the day's invasion. He says, I can state that this operation is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. He says this also to members of the House of Commons. Many dangers and difficulties which this time last night appeared extremely formidable are now behind us. The passage of the sea has been made with far less loss than we apprehended. Those are the words of Winston Churchill speaking before the House of Commons in London at a second meeting today. Mr. Churchill had gone before the House of Commons earlier today and had told of the great armada of ships, the great fleets of airplanes which we were sending over to secure our beachhead. He told us then, you remember, that the astronomical figure of 11,000 planes had been used, that 4,000 ships were standing in the channel, great warships bombarding the coast where our men were landing. And he said today, later on, coast artillery, that is the Germans' coast artillery in defense, was far less effective than anticipated. And our headquarters are saying that the invasion was made possible only through the excellent work of minesweepers. Rough weather marked the start of the undertaking, and several landing barges were swamped. The German forces resisting the Allies are believed to be under the command of Nazi Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the spokesman at headquarters said. He expressed the belief that the Germans have between 15,000 and 1,500 and 2,000 fighter planes available when they want to use them against our fleet of 11,000 planes. The Allied High Command revealed today that the invasion of Western Europe originally was scheduled to take place yesterday, but had to be postponed for 24 hours because of the bad weather. This is Don Goddard speaking from the NBC Newsroom in New York. We pause briefly now for station identification. This is WEAF New York. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the National Broadcasting Company takes you across country with stop-offs at other key NBC news points for a roundup of the domestic reaction on this greatest military story of all time. NBC newsmen are now at their microphones in Cleveland, Chicago, Denver, Hollywood, and San Francisco. We shall hear from them in that order. And so for a close-up of what the nation is thinking and feeling this very momentous day, NBC in New York switches you across the continent. For our first report, we take you to NBC in Cleveland. This is Edward Wallace in Cleveland. Here in the nation's fifth largest city, the people met the news of invasion with a spirit of quiet determination. Like the rest of the nation, most Clevelanders were asleep when the first word came. But in Cleveland's war plants, the news reached the war workers at the moment it was first announced. Radio loudspeakers brought the first bulletins to them. Work halted briefly. Only a few cheered, but most of them just stood quietly by their lates, offering a short prayer for the safety and victory of their loved ones. Then back to their vital war jobs with fresh vigor. The same spirit pervades the crowds on Cleveland streets. No cheers or any similar outburst. Here outside the NBC building, for instance, a crowd of men and women has been growing ever since the first word of the invasion came from Europe early this morning. They've been standing there for hours, listening to each bulletin as it comes through the NBC loudspeakers. Their faces are somber, and they are following each development with serious intentness. One woman spoke the mood of most Clevelanders. She's got a boy over in England, a signal corpsman, 
and it's probable that he was part of the invasion force that stormed ashore on the coast of Normandy. Her reaction to invasion? It's this. I've asked God to give us victory and take care of my son, and I know he will. All over Cleveland and in other parts of Ohio, too, church doors have swung open and the people are taking time out of their day-to-day -day duties for prayer and meditation. Mayor Lausche of Cleveland was one of the public officials with a special message for the people. Said Lausche, the command to us is to stand forth and stay at our civilian posts with increased vigor and devotion. We must humbly and solemnly pray for our youth. They are in a gigantic and perilous task and need every bit of help that we can give. And then he attended an early church service before he, too, went to work. Ohio's governor, John Bricker, calls today the beginning of the end for the forces of evil. And in the little towns around Cleveland and elsewhere in Ohio, special prayers are being offered up to hasten that end. And in the schools also, the children bowed their heads in special prayers. High up on top of Ohio's tallest building, the railroad terminal tower in Cleveland, a symbol was hoisted today. It's a 30-foot banner of black and gold, flying briskly under the stars and stripes. It was designed by the Cleveland Civilian Defense as a herald of the invasion. It will stay there until the invasion has succeeded. This is Edward Wallace in Cleveland. I switch you now to NBC in Chicago. This is Alex Dreyer speaking. Chicago's usually noisy loop was calm today. There were no excited groups on street corners, no newsboys shouting the advent of D-Day. Hotel lobbies were strangely silent, and everywhere Chicagoans received the momentous news soberly and with a prayer on their lips. Governor Green of Illinois and Mayor Kelly of Chicago both have proclaimed this a day of prayer. And churches of all denominations are holding special services throughout the day. As early as 5 a.m. Central Time, the bells began pealing their summons for early masses in the Roman Catholic churches. And as dawn was breaking, many men and women in overalls, returning from their work on the night shifts, entered their churches to pray. Brief special prayer services were arranged quickly in many of the larger defense plants. And it was the same throughout the Middle West. The bells of the old cathedral at Vincennes, Indiana, the first church in the Northwest Territory, rang out early this morning. Chicago's spirit of prayerful determination was reflected in other ways, too. Absenteeism in war plants, large and small, fell to a new low, and everywhere workers followed the news of the invasion eagerly, speeding up their work as they did. At the huge Dodge Chrysler plant, largest airplane motor plant in the world, NBC's latest invasion bulletins were posted on the bulletin boards for passing employees to read. To the military in the Chicago area, however, today was just another day in the war, to be devoted, as always, to ordinary duty. At Fort Sheridan, only the guards knew of the attack. The rest of the post slept, and the thousands of sailors at Great Lakes, Illinois, awakened with the usual grumbling of the bugler's call. But they gave forth with cheers and shouting when the mess hall loudspeaker blared out Eisenhower's official announcement that the invasion was finally on. Chicago and the Middle West have taken the news calmly. But the little city of Linton, Indiana, could only sit and wait because shortly after the invasion flash last night, the power generator in Linton blew out, cutting off all teletypes and radios in the community. The hope of many throughout the Midwest was probably expressed best by a little incident in an all-night Chicago restaurant. Upon hearing the invasion flash, a blonde in a sweeping pale blue formal gown bowed her head in a moment of prayer. And at the next table, the woman said, Now, Sammy will be back home pretty soon. We take you now to NBC in Denver. This is Ivan Schooley in Denver. The news of the Allied invasion of Western Europe was taken calmly and quietly in Denver and other sections of the Rocky Mountain region. Since the news came when most people had retired for the night, Many were not informed of the invasion until this morning, although sirens were blown in many cities as soon as the Allied Command officially confirmed the landings. The siren served as a signal to many churches throughout the area to open church doors for prayers for the success of the Allied operations. Radio stations gave night-long reports on bulletins detailing the early announcements, and many newspapers put out special editions. Switchboards at radio stations were swamped with callers asking if the news was true. In Denver, when the official announcement came, only a few midnight stragglers were on the streets. However, in most hotels, the news electrified guests, 
although there were no demonstrations. Larry Martin, editor of the Denver Post, in analyzing the importance of this new action, pointed out that the magnitude of the Allied invasion staggers the imagination. He emphasized the fact that United Nations armies had successfully negotiated their first hurdle. However, he warned that the most difficult days are coming. A Denver street cleaner, weighed down by knee-high boots, stopped his work long enough to tell how he felt about the invasion. He said one of his sons is probably in it. He's been in England for months. And the cleaner added, I'll keep sweeping the streets and let him sweep into Berlin. At Lowry Field, an army base near Denver, Air Force ground school trainees stopped on their way to mess to pray for buddies who might be in the invasion vanguard. Special D-Day services were held. Then, the soldiers continued with their regular duties, as did military personnel at other camps. Across the Continental Divide in Salt Lake City, the invasion news was received calmly, and the man on the street seemed little surprised. Everyone, apparently, has just been waiting for the big push to start. Persons interviewed were unanimous in predicting success for the Allied Expeditionary Forces. Response to the word of the satisfactory progress of the landings in France was highlighted in war plans by comments in the Denver factories making landing craft. Workers expressed the hope that landing boats they had a part in making were in on the big event. Although there was tremendous interest in news of the invasion, war workers stuck to their jobs and worked with increased enthusiasm. And those are the highlights in the Rocky Mountain region of the response to announcement of the invasion of Europe. This is Ivan Schooley in Denver. Now to NBC in Hollywood. First, we have a late bulletin from the Berlin radio. Berlin has just admitted that the beachhead on the European shores has been further widened. Local reaction in Southern California was what you'd expect of any American community. No hysterical rejoicing, pretty calm and quiet on the whole. No apathy, certainly not that. But a dignified and solemn acceptance of news awaited a long time. The impulse is definitely toward prayer, the general feeling, anxiety for the men who have history's toughest job. The three questions on everybody's lips are, how are we doing, where are we doing it, and what about casualties? Quite a few people went to church this morning who haven't been to church in a long time, and special services are scheduled throughout the day. Grown-ups, pretty solemn about it all, are hanging close to their radios wherever possible. When the first news broke at war plants in Los Angeles, including Lockheed and Douglas, the workers cocked an ear to the announcement and then redouble their efforts to turn out planes. Their feeling is one of tremendous responsibility. They've got a personal interest in those 11,000 planes which are covering the invasion attack. And in the back of most everybody's mind in this area is the thought, every mile closer to Berlin means we're another mile closer to Tokyo, too. Even the children have that idea. One little girl woke to the blare of neighborhood loudspeakers and asked, uh, What's all the noise about, Mother? Have we got those Japs where they belong? A number of Southern Californians slept through the whole thing. There weren't many reports of sirens and ringing of bells. Most Hollywood streets show either people with bloodshot eyes, the ones who've had their ears glued to a loudspeaker all night, or those with a quicker step who received the momentous news upon awakening this morning. All faces, tired and rested, show relief from tension. In, in studio language, the typical Hollywood reaction was a double take. People heard the news and then about two minutes later came up with startled faces and shouted, Huh? What? Here in Hollywood, one Marine who had just won a nightclub jitterbug contest. And all he said when he heard of the invasion announcement was, I feel kind of silly. Most folks seem to feel that way who didn't have some kind of part to play, such as aircraft workers have in this community. We're all thinking about those planes which have come off Southern California's assembly lines and which now are darkening the skies over Hitler's Europe. The prayers of this part of the coast are riding the wings of the planes our workers built. The planes our sons are flying into that inferno over there. All we can say is, God speed and God bless our boys. This is NBC in Hollywood. We take you now to NBC in San Francisco. This is Larry Smith speaking from San Francisco. I have just returned from a tour of the restaurants, the streets, and a short ride on a trolley car taking war workers to their jobs. To most San Franciscans, the invasion of the European continent was several hours old when they received the first word, because we're three hours late getting up, the New Yorkers and the East Coast residents. But now, 
everywhere in this great port of embarkation, the funnel through which the tools of war and the men to work them flow into the far reaches of the Pacific, there seems to be one calm but understandable reaction. That is, that this is a first step toward the day when the full might of the Allies can be hurled against our other mutual enemy, Japan. It's an understandable reaction because the men in uniform here are headed for New Guinea, for the Philippines, at least someplace across the Pacific where they will face the Japanese. A leathery-faced Marine, campaign ribbons filling three rows above his breast pocket, turned to me and said, Well, it had to happen, so what's all the shooting about? Didn't General Eisenhower say that it would be over in 1944? A young girl aboard the car, a girl in the metal hat of a shipyard worker, started to sob. Her husband is a paratrooper somewhere in England. That's where his last letter came from. Today, he's perhaps somewhere in France. A Chinese smiled. He saw in the defeat of Hitler the transfer of Allied power to help his staggering homeland. And Chinatown leaders started early this morning to build up a record sale of invasion bonds next week to speed the day of liberation for their country. An elderly woman stood up in the streetcar to announce proudly, my boy is with General Eisenhower's forces. He'll be in the fight. Almost everyone saw the invasion of Hitler's European fortress as a forerunner of a stepped-up war against the Japanese. And that, too, is understandable, because the Pacific Coast faces the enemy to the west rather than to the east. There is a general feeling that Russia will now enter the war against the Japs, that Stalin will grant the United States air bases, that we will invade the Kuril. Wild rumors run rampant, but beneath the surface, the reaction was simply, let's go, General Eisenhower, because the quicker the defeat of Hitler, the quicker we can get at Hirohito. Yes, San Franciscans this morning feel they can hear the sizzling of that rising sun of Japan, as it sinks into the torrent of righteous justice and retribution. They see the day when the Pacific will again be the Pacific. We return you to the NBC Newsroom in New York. New York Times this morning, a few hours before the landing began. This dispatch warned the American people not to expect too much of the French resistance movement. It pointed out the great difficulties under which the French must operate. The American decision to withhold full diplomatic recognition from General de Gaulle and the French Committee is therefore being put to its first practical test. And if the resistance movement does not live up to the hopes that some of us have placed in it, there may be a temptation to blame that on General de Gaulle rather than on the French situation as a whole. If, however, the French resistance movement does prove effective, then General de Gaulle and his French committee will have scored a double triumph. They will have prevailed not only against the opposition of the Germans, but against the doubts and hesitations of President Roosevelt and our State Department. The people of the other occupied countries with their exile and their exile leaders will also follow events in France with passionate life and death interest. They'll see first how strong we are. Then they'll see how much authority an exiled leader carries. And if General de Gaulle cannot rally the French people around him with all his contacts in the French underground, then the exiled leaders of Belgium and Holland and perhaps of Norway, too, may have reason to believe that from now on, the leaders of the resistance struggle will be found inside Europe and nowhere else. The Russians will also watch the course of the invasion with just as much interest as we are watching it over here, perhaps even with more interest, and this is why. Ever since the Germans invaded their country nearly three years ago, the Russians have been clamoring for a second front in the West. During these three years, they've had about one-third of their richest territories invaded and laid waste. Nearly one-third of the Russian people have been enslaved at one time or another by the Germans. For three years, the Russians have been living for this day of liberation because they've always believed that only large-scale military operations in the West can take enough German divisions off their necks for them to be able to hit back with decisive strength and really smash the German war machine. This Russian demand for a second front in the West is impossible to reconcile with the fears that some people have that Russia hopes and plans to dominate the whole European continent. Quite the opposite. Only by large-scale military operations in the West 
can the Anglo-American powers hope to exercise political influence over Western Europe. And the Russians are realistic enough to understand this. They'll gladly exchange a little loss of their influence, whatever it may be, in Western Europe for military assistance from us in their task of beating the main body of the German army, which, remember, is still drawn up on the Eastern Front. If today is a bright day for the Russians, it's a dark day for the Germans. The last German hope of making a separate peace with the Russians on the one hand or the Anglo-Americans on the other has now gone up the spout. Both the Russians and the Anglo-American powers are now far too deeply committed to their present strategy. They have too much to win by keeping it up, too much to lose by abandoning it. Nevertheless, we can expect to hear plenty of German propaganda that will continue to try to stir up suspicion and division between the Anglo-Americans and the Russians. The Germans are now under pressure from east, south, and west. They have a three-front war on their hands, and they'll fight this war with political as well as military weapons in the hope that somehow, somewhere, one of these offensives can be called off. And the Japanese are going to watch with deep concern what's happening in Europe right now. If the Anglo-Soviet American coalition comes through its present test in Europe, then the Japanese will have good reason to fear trouble for themselves later in Asia. But any split between the Anglo-Americans and the Russians would redound only to the benefit of Japan. That's why the combined liberation of Europe means bad news for Tokyo. Finally, there's the American aspect of today's great happenings. The United States now stands at the peak of its military, of its economic, of its political, and of its moral power in the world. Never in the history of our country has our power, our power of every sort, counted for so much as it does today. More than 150 years of American history lie behind the unexampled effort that this country is now making all over the world, not only in Western Europe, but in Italy, in the South Pacific, in Asia, on the seaways and skyways of the world, and right here at home, in our factories and on our farms. We're throwing everything we've got this summer into the greatest military operation of all time. But it's much more than a military operation. The fate of the whole world is involved, and in that fate, the United States has the decisive role to play. You have just heard Quincy Howe, Columbia's news analyst. Keep tuned to your Columbia station for a return to CBS World News Headquarters in just 30 seconds. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, here in New York, is Columbia's correspondent, John Daly. The latest news we have of the Allied invasion of northwestern France is still in that bulletin from the Associated Press in London, which reports that Prime Minister Churchill said tonight that Allied troops had penetrated, in some cases, several miles inland after effective landings on the French coast on a broad front. In Washington, President Roosevelt's top military, naval, and air chieftains reported to him that the massive Allied cross-channel assault is going well up to now. The invasion is doing all right so far, Admiral Ernest J. King, the commander-in-chief of our Navy, said as he left the White House after an hour and a half conference with the chief executive. Into our studios and our newsroom here in New York have come a series of eyewitness dispatches from the other side of the world where the fighting is going on. We'll read some of these dispatches to you to give you a clear picture of what is happening as the Allied troops storm the fortress of Hitler. Correspondent E.V. Roberts, representing the combined American press, has sent, for instance, a dispatch telling how General Eisenhower spent the hours just before our men went ashore in France. General Eisenhower, he said, stood on a rooftop on Invasion Eve and watched a mighty airborne armada form in the sky and wing its way toward France from the beginning of the final phase of the War of Liberation. The Supreme Commander radiated a calm confidence contagious to those about him. He spent the greater part of the day among the troops, seaborne and airborne, walking from group to group, chatting and laughing with the men. At 2.30 p.m., says Roberts, on Monday, Eisenhower met with a small group of British and American press and radio representatives. He told them that the invasion of Europe would be launched Tuesday and the machinery was already in motion. They were informed that the operation would be the largest of its type ever launched and that the Allies had assembled their mightiest land, sea, and air force for the purpose. Eisenhower talked to them for an hour and a half. The conference took place in his command tent, a plain, bare-walled structure about 20 feet square with canvas roof and walls of stained pine boards. At the start, he greeted each correspondent with a handshake and a friendly, lopsided grin. He stressed the importance of the job his staff officers, British and American, had done in preparing and launching the blow and spoke earnestly of his desire to emphasize this. The weather, the correspondents learned, 
had been the biggest Allied headache in the selection of D-Day. At one time, General Eisenhower interrupted his discourse to look out of the door and comment with enthusiasm upon a patch of sunshine. The general sat comfortably slouched behind his big battered desk. On the desktop was a green telephone, a desk lamp, and inkwell, and a packet of cigarettes. During the conference, he occasionally leaned forward to tap with a finger for emphasis. He smoked constantly, sometimes lighting one cigarette from another. Beyond that, he made no movement. He did not appear to notice the express train roar of constant Allied air patrols overhead. Roberts adds that after the conference, the general stood outside, hatless and with hands in pockets, and chatted with the reporters informally. They remarked upon his calmness, and one asked him, don't these things make you nervous? He chuckled and said he was the type that boiled up inside, but that when things got too bad, he was usually able to sleep it off. He told them that he planned to visit the airborne units during the evening, and that before turning in, he would probably read a little philosophy or a Wild West story. The correspondents were then permitted to tag along on the Supreme Commander's visit to the airborne units, but only with the understanding that they would remain definitely in the background. There is a warm, personal relationship between General Eisenhower and his men, and he made it clear that he wished it to remain personal. Robert says that as the party swept along a road overlooking a coastal town en route to the airborne bases, the correspondents could see a great flotilla of landing craft out at sea. At the airborne assembly areas, Eisenhower walked swiftly and alone through the groups of men where they were drawn up at attention. He asked that they be placed at ease. He stopped frequently, picking men at random to talk with. Often he was completely surrounded by the men, and they trooped after him laughing and joking like schoolboys. The reporters estimate that during the evening hours, he talked with several hundred men individually. He asked them where they were from. He seemed determined to find a paratrooper from his home state of Kansas, and what they did in civilian life, and what their army job was. And then he added personal touches. He asked a youngster where he got his hair cut, and an ex-Dakota farmer how much wheat he grew per acre. He asked about the weird war paint of the paratroopers, and was told that it was a mixture of cocoa and cottonseed oil. It tastes good, one trooper told him. The Supreme Commander's party reached the last base just at takeoff, says Roberts. At seven-second intervals, the big C-47s roared off the runway and lurched into the sky in a seeming endless stream. Eisenhower was escorted to the roof of headquarters for a better view as they circled above, coming into formation for the great task ahead. He turned his face toward France and watched them vanish in the darkening sky. And that's how General Eisenhower spent the last hours before invasion. The British radio has just reported that every plane in the vast fleet of American transport aircraft that flew with troops and equipment onto the continent was painted with broad blue and white stripes and carried colored lights, yet no fighters or heavy flak opposed it. The huge, brilliantly lighted armada stretched for more than 250 miles, continued the broadcast, which was recorded here at the CBS shortwave listening station. It traveled only a few hundred feet above the ground, and it took more than an hour to pass. It met only small arms fire, mostly from 50 caliber machine guns. Here is a late bulletin with a date line Folkestone, England on it. It says, German guns across the English Channel opened fire at 5 p.m. today for the second time since the invasion began, but ceased as soon as Royal Air Force planes appeared over them. That is, of course, 5 p.m. English time, which would be 11 a.m. New York time. Penetrations several miles inland were made by American, British, and Canadian troops, which poured into northern France by air and sea in overwhelming strength and established firm fighting fronts in the first stage of the battle for Europe. That is, in, in essence, a summary of what Prime Minister Churchill said in his report to the Commons. Mr. Churchill, in his second appearance of the day before the House of Commons, gave this stirring report of the invasion. The Supreme Headquarters of General Dwight D. Eisenhower's Allied Expeditionary Forces added to Churchill's summary by disclosing that the first in a series of four or five obstacles in the way of Europe's liberation has now been overcome, disclosing that enemy opposition was less than anticipated and that coastal defenses were weakened into virtual uselessness by air and naval bombardment, Churchill said our airborne troops are well established and our follow-up are all proceeding with very much less loss than we expected. Fighting, he said, is proceeding at various points. We have captured various bridges which are of importance and which are not blown up. There even is fighting proceeding in the town of Khan. That's spelled C-A-E-N, of course. All of this, although very valuable, is a first and vitally essential step but it gives no indication, whatever, of what may be the course of the battle in the next few days or weeks, because the enemy will not probably endeavor to concentrate in this area. Here is more detail on the American leader's report to President Roosevelt. Admiral King, you'll remember, came out of the White House a little while ago 
and seemed to be very happy about the progress of the invasion. Admiral King was at the D-Day conference with the President, together with General George C. Marshall, Army Chief of Staff, and General Henry H. Arnold, the Chief of the United States Army Air Forces. The three top-flight leaders of America's military might emerged from their conference with President Roosevelt smiling and in apparent good humor. General Marshall was asked if he could say anything about the progress of the Allied landings, and he replied, I'd rather not, but he smiled with evident satisfaction. Admiral King then said, it's doing all right so far. President Roosevelt called the officers to the White House a few hours before, and he will go on the radio to lead the American people in prayer for success of the Allied liberation of Europe. Now, evidently, the airborne troops, which would mean paratroopers, glider-borne troops, and transport troops, have played a very major part in the securing of beachheads in Hitler's Europe. And here, a United Press correspondent who has just returned to England after riding on a 9th Air Force troop carrier plane, which dropped American paratroopers on France, tells his story. It's an eyewitness description. He says American parachute infantry, spilling from troop carrier planes with deadly stealth, apparently caught German defenses by surprise before dawn and struck the first American blow at selected targets in Normandy. Thousands of paratroopers were dropped dead on targets by hundreds of Dakota carrier planes operating in three wings from myriad bases in Britain. The surprise, he says, was shown in the lack of opposition to the first plane arriving over the drop zone and the moderate and inaccurate flak encountered by those which followed. Night fighter opposition was negligible, although the big C-47s and C-53s which carried up to 18 men each, were escorted by Allied night fighters and intruders. The huge planes roared off from their bases in the dead of night, and a few hours later returned with one of the lightest casualty lists ever reported for an operation of such magnitude. The weather favored the paratroopers. The planes were able to drop below an undercast directly over the drop spots. And while the American paratroopers hit at German communications, airfields, supply dumps, and command points, British airborne units were striking farther along the French coast. Brigadier General Paul L. Williams, whose troop carriers led the invasion of Sicily, congratulated all wings in his command on the successful execution of their missions. Few crews reported difficulties. Lieutenant Arthur T. Douglas of New Orleans, who brought his decoder over the drop zone in one of the later groups, encountered heavy ground fire, which made it impossible to drop his paratroopers on the first run. He made three runs in all before dropping his human cargo. When we approached the drop zone, Douglas said, it appeared circled with machine gun fire and light flak which formed a crossfire. The bullets sounded like rain on a tin roof. We made one run, but nobody could jump. And as I started away from the target, the crew chief told me about it. We were going out over the channel, but I swung the plane around and went back over the drop zone again, trying to get under the trajectory of ground fire. That time, most of the men jumped, but there still were some unable to get away. Flak burst near us and threw three men to the floor, so we circled and went back a third time. Bullets were whizzing all around the plane and cutting it up. So when I got rid of my stick, I went to the deck and got out of range. When he says he went to the deck, of course it means he went right down as close to the ground as he could get. Major Howard W. Cannon of St. George, Utah, who was co-pilot of the lead plane, said that his crew saw fires burning furiously near the drop zone, apparently started by preparatory bombings. They looked like barrels of oil going up, is the way Major Cannon described it. His plane encountered some gunfire going over the Channel Islands, but it was ineffective, he said. Lieutenant Jack H. Smith of Hot Springs, Arkansas, saw one transport shot down. He says that we'd, we had passed the drop zone when we saw a blue pulsating flash from the plane ahead of us. We followed the burning flyer down. He went down gamely. But before he hit the drink, we saw five parachutes blossom out of the plane. That was the report of a United Press correspondent who went over Europe with American parachute troops this morning when the invasion started. America, here at home, we seem to have received the news of the invasion of Europe very calmly and then turned to the altars of our faith to pray for peace with victory. In the nation's hamlets and in the great cities, people went to churches, temples, and synagogues to meditate and to participate in the services of prayer scheduled for D-Day. There were few demonstrations. Groups gathered at newsstands and stood before radio loudspeakers. Comment generally reflected the combination of hope and trepidation which marked the end of a tense waiting period. I've just come up to New York from Washington, and on the way up I noticed in the railroad stations that the people stood very quietly and read their newspapers. Even here in New York, in the subways, instead of glancing at the front page and then running to the sports page, people were sitting quietly and reading the latest details of the invasion from their papers and 
sometimes from the stations you saw them portable radio, which was giving the latest news as they stood there. The people have been quiet. Perhaps they've tasted so often of this invasion that they now understand that just securing a beachhead doesn't mean the battle is won. They know that the days ahead of us are going to be just as difficult as those hours which followed immediately after H hour on D-Day, which is today. Thousands of men and women in war production plants observed a brief moment of silence, followed by an immediate resumption of the flow of materials of war. Plant officials announced uniformly and proudly that the announcement came without a slackening of output. Here in New York, a public prayer observance to be held at 5.30 p.m. this afternoon at the Madison Square Eternal Light World War I Memorial was announced in ceremonies which will be repeated in communities in all parts of the country. Some cities, such as Albuquerque, New Mexico, announced D-Day and H-Hour with sirens and whistles, summoning men and women to their places of worship. At the United States Veterans Hospital in here in New York, 1,800 men still hospitalized 25 years after World War I were given the news by nurses. Patients in pajamas and bathrobes, walking on crutches and canes, gathered in the hospital lawns and bowed in silent prayer. Newspapers issued extras all over the country, and radio broadcasting companies such as our CBS pushed all scheduled programs aside to bring you the news. The New York Stock Exchange halted its activities for a two-minute prayer period. Emergency orders for augmented personnel went out from the nation's telephone companies. As American servicemen accepted the news in their stride, a light note was struck by a group of French sailors in New York who linked arms and joyously danced down Broadway. That also happened in Philadelphia. I brought a new Philadelphia paper up with me, and they described there French sailors munching donuts in the Salvation Army canteen in City Hall Plaza, looking up when the women volunteer told them that paratroopers were landing in France. She had no way of knowing what the sailors thought, but she did notice that they gulped their coffee and swung across the plaza toward a subway entrance and their ship. The major racetracks suspended their programs, but generally sports events went on a schedule. Virginia civil, civilian defense officials sent over the civilian air raid warning system a summons to 8 p.m. prayer meetings in all the cities and most of the towns. Here in New York, Lord and Taylor, a specialty shop closed for the day, and its 3,000 employees were given the day off to pray and hope for victory. Now we have a bulletin here from New York which gives us further details on the young British girl, Joan Ellis, who sent through the false flag three days ago announcing the opening of the European invasion. Joan Ellis, it says, the 22-year-old British teletype operator who sent that false flag three days ago, reporting the European invasion was very happily remembered by newspaper editors when D-Day finally arrived. The newsmen here found time to message expressions of agreement with James P. Roseman, who was the managing editor of the Akron, Ohio Beacon Journal. He said, based on Joan Ellis's statement, asking America to forgive me, suggests AP editor's cable message to her. Ours would be, no one in Ohio concerned about invasion flash, good luck and carry on. That message was forwarded to the London Bureau of the Associated Press. Tell the British girl who flashed the invasion Saturday that we all love her and that she scooped the world, said the Mayfield, Kentucky messenger. The South Bend, Indiana Tribune message, please cable Joan Ellis that Indiana thinks you knew it all the time. Comments such as these came from all parts of the country, and perhaps Joan Ellis did a great good deed for her country, for we know now that great fleets loaded down with troops and having all the semblance of a full-blown invasion have sailed repeatedly up and down the coast of France. They've had the Germans and tenderhooks and time and time again sent them to their bastions of defense, only to find it was a false alarm. General Eisenhower at this time played another one of his wonderful tricks on the enemy. Watching past performances of invasions, I saw some of them in the Mediterranean myself. They got used to the idea that General Eisenhower never invaded unless the moon was waxing, was new, that the tides were high, and the H hour always came between 2 and 4 o'clock in the morning. This time, General Eisenhower let the moon go its way, let the tides pretty much go their way, and struck in daylight, probably accounting for the surprise of the Germans. Here is a late report from the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in England. More than 10,000 tons of explosives, it says, were showered on invasion coastal targets by an estimated 31,000 airmen in the eight-hour period between midnight yesterday and 8 a.m. today, spearheading the tremendous aerial armadas which by night and day blasted the path for the invading ground forces was a giant formation of well over 1,000 RAF Lancaster and Halifax bombers, which last night dropped 5,600 or more American tons of bombs 
on ten Nazi gun batteries. Remember that the Lancaster and the Halifax are the great British bombers, which have roared out over Germany these two or three years past and can carry great loads. They are the planes that usually drop the great blockbusters weighing 8,000 pounds and even 12,000 pounds. The resistance of the batteries, that's enemy batteries, has been greatly weakened by the bombing of the Air Force and the superior bombardment of our ships quickly reduced the fire of these batteries to dimensions which did not affect the problem. That is what headquarters announced, giving us the one of the clear-cut indications of the reasons for the success of our initial efforts in the liberation of Europe. The estimate of 31,000 airmen in action made by well-informed observers did not include airborne troops. Now, the well-informed observer in England is undoubtedly a capable army officer who is giving on-the-record background to guide the correspondents in their reports. We find now that the Japanese people have at last been informed of the Allied invasion of northern France. Don Mosley, our correspondent, the CBS correspondent in San Francisco, reports that Radio Tokyo has declined to editorialize in any manner concerning the success or failure of the operation. However, not a single Japanese comment has reached the Nipponese people themselves, and all Radio Ta Tokyo remarks have been almost verbatim reports of German communiques. Apparently, the Japs are playing it very cautious this morning, paying lip service to their Nazi comrades, but avoiding any firm propaganda line lest they find themselves out on a mighty weak limb. Meantime, a Mr. Ushiba, former secretary of the Japanese embassy in Berlin, said, it is not only the German high command, but also the entire German people on the home front who have been itching for this moment, because their conviction is that the enemy's European invasion is the long-awaited signal to touch off the pent-up strength of the German Wehrmacht to deal a most decisive blow to the enemy. Then Ushiba, in a sweeping remark, added his conclusion that now the Allies are walking into a death trap laid by the German high command. However, such a comment has not been told the Japs themselves. That gives us a fundamental idea of the kind of Japanese propaganda that is going out to the people of Japan. I don't think that uh, these reports from Japan necessarily indicate that the Japanese have any faith in the ability of their Axis comrades to hold the Hitler fortress of Europe. They must appreciate already that the beaches are secured. Here is a flash from uh, Reuters in London which says many secret weapons were used for the first time by the liberating armies in the invasion of northwestern France this morning. The Ministry of Supply in London revealed that information just a short while ago. We've heard in the past month, almost now for in the past two years, the reports of German secret weapons. We've had a good deal of information about their rockets, about their glider bombs and their radio-controlled tanks, but we've had very little on the Allied side in the way of boasting of our magnificent weapons. I saw some of them in operation at the Anzio beachhead. They can't be talked about even now. And yet, even those weapons, as terrible as I saw them, have been superseded by even newer weapons, since this report says that many of the secret weapons were used for the first time by the liberating armies when they broke their way into northwestern France this morning to start the long-awaited liberation of the occupied countries in Europe. The news continues to come in to the CBS newsroom. We will be standing by here to give you the latest reports as they come in. The latest report we have so far on the progress of the fighting is the announcement from Prime Minister Churchill that there have been penetrations of several miles. Radio France in Algiers broadcasts a statement by André Le Troquet, who is the French Commissioner for the Administration of Liberated Territories in Metropolitan France, declaring that the liberation of France has started. Following is the text of the statement as broadcast to French areas and reported by the Federal Communications Commission. Events expected by the whole of the French people have finally taken place, says Mr. Le Trocaire. Our hope becomes a reality. The liberation of France has started. In this most solemn hour of our history, we all have only one duty, total sacrifice for the motherland. French blood will flow again. Think of the sufferings that our brothers will have to endure to be finally liberated. Let us unite all our thoughts in the certainty that tomorrow France will be free and we shall make her greater and more beautiful than she has ever been. That report came from Algiers, the seat of the French Committee of National Liberation, and was made by André de Troquet, the French Commissioner for the Administration of Liberated Territories in Metropolitan France. Meanwhile, we received earlier today the news from London that General de Gaulle has arrived in England and evidently has already held consultations with the British authorities looking for 
the complete cooperation of the people inside France. What can we can expect in the way of cooperation and help from the French people must still remain a question mark. We do know that there are Frenchmen who have fought against the Germans underground for many, many months, for many years inside France. We will only have to wait now for time to see if all France rises to help us, and we feel sure that they will. These reports that we have just read you, eyewitness reports and the last-minute details of the news of the invasion, have just come into our newsroom and constitute the latest information that we have. You have just heard CBS correspondent John Daly. And now, while we wait for more news on the invasion, we will present another program. Our Gal Sunday, presented by the makers of Anison, Life Can Be Beautiful, presented by the makers of Ivory Soap, and Ma Perkins, presented by the makers of Oxidor, were not broadcast today because of the special news you've just heard. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Eastern Wartime, your station, WEAF, New York. Continuing its up-to-the-minute coverage of the Allied invasion of northern France, the National Broadcasting Company now presents Don Hollenbeck. Mr. Hollenbeck is heard regularly from the New York studios of NBC and has seen lengthy foreign service. He was formerly heard from Italy, where he covered that campaign, notably the Allied landing at Salerno. Mr. Hollenbeck. First, a reminder to listen to the broadcast from NBC of King George, 3 p.m. Eastern Wartime over your NBC station. Guinea pigs used for experimental purposes seldom live to talk about the experiment. As one of the guinea pigs for this invasion of Europe today, I'm lucky enough to be alive to give a guinea pig's reaction to the real thing. Africa, Sicily, and Italy were the laboratories. At Salerno, we got the final tests. The lessons learned by the Fifth Army at Salerno are in a large part responsible for these initial successes today. The battles aren't won yet by any means, but some of the failures and shortcomings at Salerno are being turned to good account as the Allies pour into Western Europe. Lesson number one, you've got to have air power, plenty of air power to cover the landing operations. We didn't have it, and at that time it was simply impossible to get it. Our fighter planes had to make round trips from Sicily. We had no landing strips any closer than that, and there weren't any carrier-based craft to cover us up. The long round trips meant the air forces had very little time to spend protecting us. Half an hour, 45 minutes at the most. Consequently, for a good part of the time, the only planes over us were JU-88s, ME-109s, FW-190s. We were never sure from one moment to the next that our narrow hole in the Salerno Beach wouldn't be blasted loose by the dive bombers. How different today... Under that tremendous umbrella of 11,000 aircraft of all types, the Allies have absolute mastery of the air over the invasion beaches. And I know how much better the earthbound soldiers in Normandy must be feeling this afternoon because they know that air umbrella is over their heads. No chance of it leaking to let death and destruction through. Lesson number two, sea power. We rolled up the Mediterranean from various points in Africa and Sicily under escort, of course, but the escort was the barest minimum. No more than could absolutely be spared to protect the invading force. The navies had other jobs to do, other points at which to stand guard. As we hit the beach, there were a few destroyers, a few cruisers at our backs, the Dido and Mauritius, I remember, blasting away behind us at the German shore positions. It was several days before the really big stuff could get up. Those were the bad days when the German armored divisions were smashing down the Seely River, and it looked as if our visit to Italy might be a short and a bitter one. Finally they came... Our own Pennsylvania, the British war spite and valiant, stood at our backs and sent tons of metal screaming over our heads and into the well-concealed German gun positions that were themselves battering a path for the German armored divisions and striking out to sea to hold up our landing of the reinforcements and supplies that were so badly needed. Looking back, it seems to me to be a draw whether it was air cover we finally got or the sea power that finally pulled up to back us up and take care of the German positions. It was impossible for the land forces to get at. Impossible for our little force of bombers to locate in those wild hills that end so abruptly in the Gulf of Salerno with only a little beach between them and the sea. Again, how different today. The mightiest sea force ever assembled. 4,000 ships to stand offshore and cover the landing forces. Undoubtedly, some of those ships that backed us up at Salerno and in Africa and Sicily 
are standing off the coast of Normandy today. As one of the guinea pigs who came back, I can speak with feeling about what a difference this makes to men who must do the grubby, dirty, bloody job of war. The infantrymen, the airborne troops, the paratroopers who must come to close grips with a savage enemy. You get as near a feeling of confidence as you can get when you know that there's air power to keep off the enemy planes. Sea power to silence the big guns lying hidden in front of you. We used to grumble at the sound of our 16-inchers, our own 3.7 slugging at the Germans. It was the kind of comfortable grumbling you do when you're comparatively safe. Men in panic, men in momentary fear of their lives have no time to grumble. There's probably some of that same kind of grousing going on in Normandy at this very moment. Veterans of other campaigns can get a little long-winded comparing and second-guessing. At the risk of that, I believe the men of the 5th Army in that little arc of the beaches of Salerno contributed a great deal to these landings today. Those who didn't come back from the beaches of Salerno, those who came back maimed but alive them is owing a great debt that every one of us, every soldier going into France today, every airman and every sailor must not forget. Thank you, Don Hollenbeck. This is the NBC Newsroom in New York, ladies and gentlemen, and in just ten seconds we're going to take you to London for a special broadcast. Stand by, if you will, and then again we'll hear from Don Hollenbeck. Go ahead, London. Just one moment, please. We're trying to establish contact with London. Go ahead, London. NBC Newsroom in New York. We're sorry that we can't establish contact there with London at this time. Just as soon as we're able to overcome the technical difficulties, we'll take you there. But in the meantime, here is Don Hollenbeck once again. And here's some more detail on Prime Minister Churchill's second statement of the day. The Prime Minister said tonight Allied troops had penetrated in some cases several miles inland after, an, after effective landings on the French coast on a broad front. The Prime Minister said he had visited the various centers where the latest information was received and could state that this operation is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. Many dangers and difficulties which appeared at this time last night extremely formidable are behind us, the war leader reported. Passage of the sea has been made with far less loss than we apprehended, Mr. Churchill said. The resistance of batteries has been greatly weakened by bombing by the Air Force, and the superior bombardment of our ships quickly reduced their power to dimensions which did not affect the problem. And here's still more on Churchill's statement. The Prime Minister announces that Allied airborne troops had captured several strategic bridges in France before they could be blown up. And there is even fighting proceeding in the town of Cannes. Churchill addressing the House of Commons after a visit to General Dwight D. Eisenhower's headquarters in company with King George described the landing of airborne troops on the European continent as an outstanding feat on a scale far larger than anything there has been seen so far in the world. And another reminder now, listen to King George at 3 p.m. over your NBC station, 3 p.m. King George. Continuing with the Prime Minister, these landings took place with extremely little loss and great accuracy. Earlier, the Prime Minister told the cheering house that the Allied liberating assault was proceeding according to plan, and what a plan. Just a year ago today, I was broadcasting from London for NBC. This story led the broadcast, and I quote, When the great day of invasion comes, and it can't be far away, the British Navy is ready. Never before has the Navy been in a stronger position. The spirit of the crews has never been higher. They know that now they will go into action with an air umbrella sufficiently powerful to offset the efforts of the diamond torpedo bombers that have been their greatest worry since the war began. Britain has built a thousand warships since 1939. Units of this great fleet are already at battle stations, ready for the signal. Well, that was one year ago today. That broadcast might have been given moments before this great news came today. And if it was the situation one year ago, it isn't difficult to know with what spirit the men of the Allies went into France today. One year has seen the growth of those navies and air forces to proportions probably not dreamed of then. If ever we were ready to strike, we were ready today. At Salerno, sometimes we wondered if it wasn't too little and too soon. We held on by the skin of our teeth, but we held on. Today the word must be, 
enough and at the right moment. And here's a late bulletin. President Roosevelt's top military, naval, and air chieftains reported to him today that the massive Allied cross-channel assault is doing well up to now. The invasion is doing all right so far, Admiral Ernest J. King, Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, said as he left the White House after an hour and a half's conference with the Chief Executive. And another late report, Suprema Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces says more than 10,000 tons of explosives were showered on invasion coastal targets by an estimated 31,000 airmen in the eight-hour period between midnight yesterday and 8 a.m. today. Now, once again, we'll try to establish contact with London. NBC Newsroom in New York, we take you now to London. The time has come to deal the enemy a terrific blow in Western Europe. The blow will be struck by the combined sea, land, and air forces of the Allies, together constituting one great Allied team under the supreme command of General Eisenhower. On the eve of this great adventure, I send my best wishes to every soldier in the Allied team. To us is given the honor of striking a blow for freedom which will live in history. And in the better days that lie ahead, men will speak with pride of our doings. We have a great and a righteous cause. Let us pray that the Lord mighty in battle will go forth with our armies and that his special providence will aid us in the struggle. I want every soldier to know that I have complete confidence in the successful outcome of the operations that we are now about to begin. With stout hearts and with enthusiasm for the contest, let us go forward to victory. And as we enter the battle, let us recall the words of a famous soldier spoken many years ago. These are the words he said. He either fears his fate too much, or his deserts are small, who dare not put it to the touch, to win or lose it all. Good luck to each one of you, and good hunting on the mainland of Europe. This is the NBC Newsroom here in New York, and here is Don Hollenbach with further comment. First, a bulletin from Folkestone. German guns across the English Channel opened fire at 5 p.m. today for the second time since the invasion began, but ceased as soon as Royal Air Force planes appeared over them. You remember Joan Ellis, the 22-year-old British teletype operator who sent that false flash three days ago reporting the inv European invasion. Well, Joan is happily remembered by newspaper editors now that D-Day has finally arrived. Newsmen found time to message expressions of agreement with James P. Roseman, managing editor of the Akron, Ohio Beacon Journal, who said, based on Joan Ellis' statement, asking America to forgive me, suggest AP editors cable message to her. Ours would be, no one in Ohio concerned about invasion flesh. Good luck and carry on. And incidentally, that voice you just heard from London was General Montgomery... Good word and good cheer to his troops. More about Joan Ellis. Tell the British girl who flashed the invasion Saturday that we all love her and that she scooped the world. The South Bend, Indiana Tribune message. Please cable Joan Ellis that Indiana thinks you knew it all the time. And now a moment for a look at other war theaters. There the news is not so good as it is from Europe. The Fourth Battle of Changsha opened yesterday as Japanese troops advancing along several routes reached the outer defenses of the Ki Hunan province stronghold the Chinese high command announces tonight. Three times in the past six years, the Chinese have hurled back the invaders from the gates of the city, barring enemy control of the Hankow Canton Railroad, but the latest Japanese offensive appears the most determined of all. One Japanese column reached Changsha's outskirts after pushing down the roadbed of the Hankow Canton Railway from captured Kwai Yi, while another enemy spearhead advanced from Ping Kiang, 50 miles northwest of Changsha. On the left bank of the central China front, the invaders broke into Yuan Qiang on the south shore of Lake Tung Ting, 50 miles northwest of Changsha, the communique says, and were attacking Yi Yang, Su River Town, 48 miles northwest of the Hunan capital. And according to the OWI, a late bulletin, 
Radio France in Algiers has broadcast a statement by André Le Troquet, French Commissioner for the Administration of Liberated Territories in Metropolitan France. He declares, the liberation of France has started. And one more reminder, 3 p.m. Eastern Wartime, King George over your NBC station. Don't fail to hear King George 3 p.m. over your NBC station. And now, a brief roundup. Allied invasion armies landed in northwestern France today, drove at least nine and a half miles into the German West Wall to the town of Cannes. After 12 hours of fighting, they held beachheads on a broad front along the coast of Normandy. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard a news report by Don Hollenbeck of the National Broadcasting Company's news staff. We suggest that you stay dialed to NBC for the latest details and for each development of this invasion operation. We are making every effort to bring you this story just as it unfolds, or rather as it is unfolded to us here in the NBC newsroom in New York, the crossroads of the news. This is the National Broadcasting Company. W-E-A-F, New York. The National Broadcasting Company continues its invasion coverage from Washington as we bring you now Morgan Beatty from the NBC Newsroom in Washington. Mr. Beatty. General Eisenhower's Supreme Allied Headquarters in London tonight reflects the air of optimism that pervades the regular news report. A headquarters spokesman said this at about 7 p.m. London time. Opposition in all quarters was less than expected. Allied naval losses were very, very small. Casualties in the first attacks were less than expected. Coastal gunfire was sporadic. Only 50 German planes were sighted over the invasion coast area in the first eight hours of assault. Allied planes, for their part, dumped 10,000 tons of bombs out of 7,500 planes, and still the air armadas take off from Britain. There is divided opinion as to why the Germans failed to meet the first wave of Allied forces, the wave that pierced the invasion coast, up to 12 miles on the original thrust. Prime Minister Winston Churchill himself made a careful inspection of all reports tonight, and in London, he said, you remember, he says that the Allies did not achieve tactical surprise, or rather did achieve tactical surprise. This, however, does not mean strategic surprise. There's a difference. For those of us who don't know our military terms, there's a difference between tactical and strategic surprise. What the Prime Minister was saying was this. The Germans knew, because of its nature, our general plan to assault the coasts of Europe. They did not know the time and the place, so they were surprised in a given area, but not in a general way. That's the difference between tactical and strategic surprise in military assault. The Germans, we can now report had no opportunity to guess the timing of invasion because General Dwight Eisenhower was the man who set that time. He had it set for Monday, yesterday, and because of bad weather, he changed his mind and put the great assault off for 24 hours. A few minutes ago, here in Washington, Admiral Ernest King of the Navy and General George Marshall and General Henry H. Arnold visited the White House. Mr. General Arnold, of course, is with the Air Forces. They discussed war reports with the President. They had nothing to say about their conference with the chief executive when they came out. Only one of the three had anything to say about the invasion itself. Quite fittingly, it was Admiral King of the Navy, the service that helped the Royal Navy put the invasion troops ashore in France. Admiral King shares the cautious optimism of Mr. Churchill. Invasion, he told reporters, is doing all right so far. The others smiled as if in complete agreement. It seems, therefore, at the moment, that cautious optimism is warranted. The Germans did not have the coastal defense system at the point of attack that they should have had, and for reasons that do not appear in the news report at this time. But optimism must be tempered with the realization that the enemy has not yet committed his skilled air force, what's left of it, nor his veteran reserves in Western Europe. He's counting on those reserves for counterattacks. But let's go to the Pentagon building across the river from Washington for a military interview that will cover this and other points. Go ahead, NBC Pentagon. Here in our NBC broadcasting booth in the Pentagon building are two American Army officers who've recently returned from the European Theater of Operations. Both were on hand to witness the final preparatory stages for D-Day. They are Colonel Robert O. Montgomery of the Field Artillery, whose present assignment is at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and Lieutenant Colonel John R. Ulmer of the Infantry, 
who is stationed in Washington as assistant editor of the Infantry Journal. Both Colonel Montgomery and Colonel Ulmer went to England as observers for the Army ground forces. Uh, Colonel Montgomery, I believe the people at home would very much like to know the extent of the training of our troops for this invasion. You saw many of these troops in England. Can you tell us something about them? The troops of the Army ground forces in England were either veterans of combat in other theaters or troops that had undergone complete basic unit training in the United States. The troops who had seen combat in other theaters showed extreme confidence in their ability to carry out their missions. They were all anxious to get it over with, to go into combat as soon as possible. Their physical condition was excellent, their morale of the highest. Now, what about the troops that hadn't seen combat, Colonel? The men fresh from the States. The troops who hadn't been in combat also had a high order of morale, and their physical condition appeared to be excellent, too. They appeared to be well-trained, insofar as men could be well-trained without actually engaging in battle. I saw at no time any evidence of lack of confidence in their own individual ability or in their leader. Colonel Montgomery, how much training did these men have that approximated the conditions they are now facing as they land on the European continent? All the tactical divisions went through the excellent course of training at the United States Army Assault Training Center in England. There they practiced making landings on hostile beaches. The beaches were mined with reduced charges of landmines. They also learned how to move forward to capture objectives several miles from the beach. They worked with full-scale models of concrete seawalls, exact duplicates of the German Atlantic coast defenses which they're up against now. Uh, Colonel Elmer, it's about time we heard from you. What about the weapons used by our assault forces? Uh, many types of weapons were probably used. Infantry mortars, chemical mortars, fieldatory fire, probably from landing craft, flamethrowers. And, and in the initial stages, naval gunfire is effective against concrete fortifications. Colonel Montgomery, do you have anything to add on that score? Well, concrete emplacements may be attacked in various ways. By rocket fire from launchers mounted on medium tanks, by point-blank artillery fire from 155-millimeter guns and those of higher caliber, and by engineering methods, by pushing explosives up against the wall, by tanks, or placing them there by hand. And, of course, by bombing operations from the air. Planes can hurt concrete fortifications if they hit them at a crucial point, but I think aviation will be used to harass enemy supply lines and to strafe enemy troops. Well, what about the possibility of an early German counterattack? Colonel Montgomery? We can expect local German counterattacks at any time, but a concentrated, coordinated German counterattack will probably not take place until the German high command feels sure they know where the principal Allied effort is being made. Colonel Ulmer, how about a word for your special field of interest, the infantry, the humble doughboy? Thousands of tons of equipment and gear were shipped to England. Hundreds of specialists had to do many small tasks. But their only purpose was and is to get the man with the rifle forward, the infantryman. He's the guy who's going to win this operation. From General Eisenhower on down, the idea is to get the man with the rifle forward. He may travel by air or on a boat, but when he wins this thing, he'll do it on his own two feet. Well, there's more to an infantryman than these days than just a man with a rifle. Isn't that right, Colonel Almer? Yes. Today's uh, infantryman fights not only with a rifle and bayonet, but with mortars, cannon carbines, automatic rifles, light and heavy machine guns, and grenades. An infantry regiment has at least 15 different weapons, but all of them are only to get that doughboy with the rifle in his hand forward. And how about a last word from you, Colonel Montgomery? I believe, and I know Colonel Elmer agrees, that the American Army taking part in the invasion today is the best equipped and best trained American Army that has ever entered the initial stages of combat. Thank you, Colonel Robert Montgomery and Lieutenant Colonel John Ulmer. Now back to Morgan Beatty. Thank you, Holly Wright, Colonel Montgomery, and Colonel Ulmer. There are two points there that I think will bear repeating. The point of the fact that this army that's attacking the coast of Europe today is the most experienced army of its kind in history. That sounds strange, coming as it does from a nation that has not been at war and has not planned for war for many years. But you must remember that this is amphibious attack in a modern way. And we are more experienced in amphibious attack in all parts of the world, the British and ourselves, 
than any other armed forces. And then that other point about the infantrymen. The other day, Admiral Cochran came to this studio and with me pointed out the very important thing that infantry men must take real estate before anything can happen in the way of victory in warfare. A couple of hours ago, I sat in the Senate with a group of our lawmakers discussing invasion. Some of them went on the air to express their feelings to you and what they were thinking. I've never seen the lawmakers of the nation in quite the mood they expressed today. Senator Alvin Barkley sat silent in his chair. The majority leader, the leather-lunged orator, was not in an oratorical mood. But he came to the microphone and said just about what any boy's father would say. And then his mind went back to the hymns of childhood in old Kentucky. Like all of the rest of us, Senator Barkley seemed to sense that this is a supreme moment in history. The men and women who must carry us through now are at their battle stations. They've already begun to take part in the greatest military effort of all time. The combined effort more nations than you can count on your fingers and toes are making. All of us share hopes and fears for these brave men. But there are people in the background, millions of them, who've done more than just hope, more than fear. They represent the spirit of people generally in the allied world, civilians in the rear rank, you might say. There are people like Mary Galasso, whom I met in England more than a year ago, a second-generation British girl of Italian descent, a girl from Liverpool. And... In a short year's time, Mary Galasso won her way from complete obscurity to a place on the envied 1,000 crew of girls who aimed the deep-throated anti-aircraft guns in the darkness at Hitler's blitzing planes over England. Mary was a poor toy factory girl who wanted to do something big for Britain, so she got a job in the ATS, the Women's Auxiliary Army, a British version of the WAX over here, and Mary mastered the radar control system, and when I saw her in Britain, she was the champion calculator of her gun emplacement in the London zone. Mary's 33, unmarried, and she wants to make a career out of Britain's guns. And she's tending one of those guns today on Invasion Day. Another great woman in Britain is Grandma Pegg. Mrs. Mary Pegg is her real name, who's turning out airplanes or helping to in her 79th year. I get up, she says, at 6 o'clock and come home at 7 in the evening, but it's worth it to smash Hitler. And I almost left out the telephone operator in London who lost both arms in the original Blitz. She's 18 and... After she had lost her arms, she had the burning ambition to return to work. So officials of the Ministry of Pensions sent a limb manufacturing mechanic around to her hospital, and he spent months on the job. There's a special gadget now on her right arm, a sort of extension, and a billiard cue rest for the other arm. Mechanical bits and pieces, as they say in Britain, enable this girl to dial phones and plug in cords. And she's on the job today for invasion, freeing another worker for more vital war work. Here in America, the pressure for woman power to fill out the gaps, piece out the manpower, is not so great. Even so, Fritz Reiner of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra has taken on 18 women. Two of these women played the stringed bass, usually reserved for men. Few of us realize how important it is to carry on with the regular affairs of everyday life in wartime, especially in these critical hours, so long as we do not impair the tempo of the battle. These 18 women in Pittsburgh are doing their part. Then there's George Walkham, a junior of Chicago, and his neighborhood gang. They set out a few weeks ago to collect waste paper to help win the war. George's three little sisters, between six and ten with the advance agents, they scouted out new sources of supply through the neighborhood. George and his brother, uh, George Cortelet, they're 12 and 13, with a heavy man with a wagon, the Walkhamer's little red, wa red wagon. And in four days, working after school and evenings, these children collected 4,622 pounds of waste paper. Mrs. Wolkemer was surprised and curious about all this sudden industry. What inspired the campaign, and when would it end, she asked. And sure enough, there was a plan. George and his gang wanted money. Yes, money for model plane kits, George's favorite hobby. But the kits were going to wounded soldiers in a hospital in the nearby neighborhood. And then there's the tragic side of civilian work in war. In Silver Spring, Maryland, near Washington the other day, a funeral procession rolled slowly away from the mortuary. It was just like any other funeral, you'd think. They were burying Mrs. Lorraine B. Chandler, a 21-year-old Navy bride of eight months. Nobody would have known that Mrs. Chandler was a war hero. Nobody fired any salutes. Nobody played taps. But she was a war hero. For Lorraine Chandler died in the Bureau of Standards in Washington. She was blown through a second-story window in an explosion. The details cannot be told until after this war has passed us by. All they'll say over at the Bureau of Standards is that 
Lorraine was working with four other scientists, most of them youngsters like herself, on an urgent war project to make our aviation gasoline better, the very gasoline that is propelling the planes on invasion day. And, we're told, they did make aviation gasoline better. But Lorraine Chandler might as well have died on the battlefield or in an airplane like the Colin Kellys and all the others who won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Because, after all, it takes 120 civilians to make a war, as well as 10 million brave fighting men. And some of these civilians, a few, give their lives too. That's all for now, and thank you. I'll be back tomorrow at this same time. You've heard Morgan Beatty from the NBC Newsroom in Washington and his analysis of the Invasion News. We also heard from Colonel Robert Montgomery and Colonel Ulmer speaking from the huge Army Pentagon building across the Potomac River from the nation's capital. Morgan Beatty is heard over most of these same stations every weekday, Monday through Friday, from the NBC Newsroom in Washington. Tomorrow, at this same time, keep up with the news with Morgan Beatty. This is the National Broadcasting Company. It's two o'clock Eastern War Time. This is WEAF, New York. Next in its complete coverage of Invasion News, NBC presents war reporter and news analyst Elmer Peterson. Mr. Peterson was in Warsaw, Poland, when the Germans invaded that country. He then moved on to Scandinavia. It was there when the Nazis stormed into North Europe. He will give you a military and political picture of events leading up to today's great thrust. Mr. Peterson. Hour by hour, the story of the invasion is being filled in. We're getting a better idea of what's involved, not only in equipment and preparation, but in what we are expending in human effort and courage. But these are hours also when we have reason to reflect with pride on what we have achieved to gain the present moment. For this is a moment of great and effective contrasts, if we consider how far we've traveled since the start of the war in Europe. Now we're using some 11,000 planes in this invasion. We're using 4,000 ships. We are using all sorts of new and modern equipment. But we can think back to that September day in 1939 when the Germans struck at Poland. The Germans had things their own way then. They moved with precision and deliberation. Their bombers swept over Warsaw against little or no resistance. I was in Warsaw at that time. I watched the citizens of Warsaw parading with enthusiasm through the streets when they learned that Britain and France had declared war on Germany. Now, shouted the Poles, the Germans will pay their price. But a week later, the Polish government was fleeing from Warsaw. Berlin had not been bombed. The Germans had not been punished. Britain and France were unprepared. There was nothing they could really do. They had relied on sea power, on blockade, on that pompous and outworn defense idea known as the Maginot Line. And again in April 1940, I watched the Germans strike with the advantage of thorough preparation, this time into Denmark and Norway. Today, the expeditionary force sent by the British and French to Norway at that time seems like something out of the days of ancient warfare. What a contrast in preparation, in efficiency, between the fighting in Norway in the spring of 1940 and what we are seeing now in France. Those British territorials who went to Norway were badly equipped, badly clothed. They had no air support. They had no modern weapons by present standards. They provided evidence, shocking evidence, of how the democracies had failed to appreciate what the Germans had created in the way of an army. The Germans had the advantage in surprise attack, in methodical preparation just as we now have that advantage. What they profited by in Poland, in Norway, were their years of patient study, their scheming, and their developed use of fifth columnists. Think, too, of how easily the Germans took Denmark, how by merely demonstrating their power, they forced the Danes to yield with hardly a shot being fired. I remember talking to Copenhagen on the first day of the German invasion of that country with a German officer I had known in Berlin. We'll win, don't you think, he said to me. No, I said, out of some stubborn conviction, you won't win in the end. You can't win. He looked at me with surprise. But you see what we have, he replied. You were in Poland. You've worked in Germany. What can the British and French put up against us? I had to agree that he had some justification for his own confidence. For it was difficult.
able to watch the manner in which the Germans went into Scandinavia without wondering how the democracies would retrieve their position. Even though the lesson is learned, one thought, how can we catch up with all this enormous German concentration of striking power, their well-laid strategy? And the events that followed, the advance of the Germans through the Low Countries, those tragic days of Dunkirk, those fateful days in North Africa before the tide of battle turned, all these things gave good cause to wonder. Yes, it's when we think of these things that we realize the enormity of Allied achievement in war production, in winning the Battle of the Atlantic, in patiently devising a strategy of victory, that strategy which now sees our soldiers, our planes, our ships beating hard against the continent of Europe. Every few minutes now, there's a new report which shows how magnificently this present invasion has been planned, how much attention there has been to the smallest detail. Yes, the Germans have had their day of outmaneuvering, outsmarting the Allies. Now the tables have been turned. The American soldiers who have gone ashore in France, those 30,000 American paratroopers now fighting somewhere behind the German lines, are equipped with the best weapons that can be devised. In fact, the British Ministry of Supply has just announced that many secret weapons were used for the first time by the Allies in their invasion of western France today. Moreover, these soldiers of ours are fighting under efficient leadership. They play their part in plans that have been worked out over a period of years. What a contrast that presents to those soldiers who four years ago tried to beat back the Germans in Norway. What great forward strides we have made since those days when the people of Poland fled before the German attack. What we are seeing now is a vindication of what was once considered unwarranted delay in opening the second front. For we have, after all, had to wait until we could strike with full effect, until we could build up from those days when, out of failure to appreciate German intentions, we were not fully prepared. In other, among other things, we are striking now with full and complete information. Our intelligence service, which failed so badly during those early days of the war, now is functioning efficiently. And the Germans already are claiming that they've arrested and captured many so-called, what they consider enemy agents during the invasion so far. And there are remarkable contrasts to consider also as regards the people of Europe. In fact, this is a day to consider the confidence that once prevailed in Germany during those days when the German radio reported nothing but victory, when the German people were flushed with their thoughts of mastering Europe completely, and Russia as well, to say nothing of their hopes of dominating the world. Goering, you'll recall, once boasted that no planes would ever reach Berlin. Today, the Germans face an estimated 11,000 planes available to support the invasion alone. And we have yet to see the full evidence of what our air power will do now to further a victorious advance toward Berlin. We don't, of course, as yet know how freely the Nazis have revealed to the German people the full details of the present invasion. We do know that the news is bound to affect the German people. I find myself thinking now of a day in Berlin in 1940. In a German motion picture theater, I watched a newsreel showing the Nazi version of their triumph at Dunkirk. Strangely enough, there was only a smattering of applause. And the reason was apparent. Many of the Germans in that theater had memories of the last war. And in the back of their minds, there was even then the disturbing thought that the last war might repeat itself. In fact, I heard one German say, yes, it's all very fine, but we've had mar we had marvelous victories up to the last day of the first war also. So we can only reflect on what will be the effect on such thinking of today's news that Allied armies are back on the continent at a time when Rome has been captured in a, new, in a great symbolic victory, at a time when the German armies have been driven out of Russia, with the Red Armies poised for new offensives. In fact, the Allied invasion of France has touched off considerable speculation concerning Russia. In London, military observers, according to a report just in, say that probably within 24 to 48 hours, and almost certainly before the end of this week, Soviet armies will swing their vast power into a synchronized offensive with the Anglo-American Western Front. The German radio itself indicates that they have a, Germans have a strong fear of this. In any event, the, the fact that we appreciate the importance of the invasion on the German mind is evident in the reports of how thoroughly our own propaganda organization is now at work, how we are making every effort to take the most advantage of the great attack now underway in the field of psychological warfare in the field of nerve warfare against the enemy. What we 
we need now is to actually see Allied troops on German soil, to offer another convincing proof to the German people that they cannot in the end win, that they can only hope to avoid some destruction of war by surrendering. And we must consider, too, that the Germans from now on are going to pay increasing attention to their hopes and plans of getting some advantage out of the surrender they must make in the end. The Germans, we can be sure, are going to fight on as long as they can, and they may be able to delay their surrender for many weeks, perhaps months to come. We mustn't make the mistake of assuming that merely because we've established some successful beachheads, victory is assured. These landings today are by no means synonymous with complete and thorough victory, although we have every reason to hope that our plans have been so well laid and that our attacking force is so great that we are bound to sweep on very quickly, perhaps, toward final victory. But we have had ample evidence that the Germans want, if possible, to fight still another war. They want, if possible, to surrender while millions of German soldiers are still not aware of defeat, while Germany is still intact in many respects as an economic unit, and with German soil not turned into a battleground, rather with the countries around Germany torn and suffering by the impact of war. One thing is certain, the Germans will do a good and thorough job of destruction as they now retreat before the invasion forces. For the invasion now underway is not only intended to bring Allied troops into Berlin, it's also designed to destroy the German armies, to administer the same sort of beating that General Alexander is inflicting on the Reichswehr in Italy. It's all the more reason why we may, at any moment now, hear of new Allied offensives designed to trap and encircle and destroy German fighting men. There's been a belief that the German High Command will in the end try to use the very fact of surrender as a weapon against the Allies, to create as much confusion as possible, to save something of the German war machine. And from now on, this belief is going to come into further prominence. For we have set in motion by the invasion weapons which may bring deep and profound political complications in a decision as to when and how we are going to accept German surrender. From now on, it's going to be a question not only of obtaining German surrender, but of deciding also under what conditions, under what circumstances we want to accept that surrender, and from whom. There's another contrast to be considered now. As our troops have moved onto the continent, there have been appeals to the patriots of the occupied countries to help. We have just received, for example, the, the text of the uh, appeal made by General Charles de Gaulle to his people of France from London. General de Gaulle broadcast to his own people that the Allies were certain of victory over the Nazis in the now Second Battle of France. He exhorted the French to fight with all means at their disposal to destroy the Germans in this battle for liberation. All those who can take action, said de Gaulle, with the Allied armies or engage in demolition work, must not let themselves be made prisoners by the Germans, he said. And here de Gaulle emphasized something which is very obvious, namely that now as the invasion proceeds, we will see a greater flurry of mass arrest by the Germans as they seek to divert all possible adult citizens out of the war zone and keep the underground movement from giving assistance to the Allies. Certainly the story of what will now happen in these occupied countries is going to make a brilliant chapter in the final victory. We have yet to see how much the German armies will suffer now from sabotage, from wrecked railways and bridges, from direct attacks, for that matter, from the underground armies. For hope in these occupied countries now has become a vital and living thing. The people of these countries have suffered and endured, but they have come a long ways from those days when, in France, in Norway, in the Netherlands, there was a feeling of deep despair. As a correspondent who saw the first reaction in such countries as Poland and Denmark, I can appreciate what this day must mean to the people of Europe. People like the Danes once were bewildered and confused. People like the Norwegians, for all their courage, had their moments of wondering if the future held any promise whatsoever. I saw their tears, their anguish at the beginning. Now, backed by years of preparations, they are ready to do their share. I predict that the very extent of organized underground resistance now to be revealed, aided by Allied equipment, will be more than amazing. And finally, there are the German satellite nations, those people who once were confident that Hitler would win, who staked their future on that victory. Up until now, they've been sustained by their final hope 
that somehow the Germans might manage to block the invasion. But there has been the lesson of Rome. And now, a so far successful in landing in France, a landing which we have every reason to believe will continue successful. And so the next few days may see great political upheavals in those satellite countries, especially when the Red Armies add their power to that now being thrown against the Germans from the West. In any event, we are on the threshold of great and important political advantages as well as military advantage. And here is a new bulletin just in. The Berlin Radio, in a German-language broadcast monitored by NBC, states that new Allied landings have been made on the French coast in the area of Carentan, roughly opposite the Channel Island of Jersey. No details are given, but it is an indication that Allied strategy goes beyond the main landings we have already reported. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard Mr. Elmer Peterson, NBC war reporter and news analyst. We suggest that you stay dialed to NBC for the latest details and for each development of this invasion operation. We're bringing you this story just as it is unfolded here in the NBC newsroom in New York. We now present music from New York. Just one moment, please. Newsroom in New York. This has been a day of momentous news, 
And not the least of the spectacular reports we have broadcast here from the NBC newsroom in New York was the eyewitness account of our Stanley Richardson, the first reporter to bring back a first-hand report from one of the naval ships which took part in the invasion. His report was first broadcast early this morning. Now, for the benefit of NBC's listeners, we bring you a transcription of this historic broadcast by Stanley Richardson. Not a recognizable enemy plane appeared overhead. At least no bombs were dropped at or on any of the ships in our area. No low-flying fighters came over to strafe us with machine gun fire. And no enemy vessel, not even one of their vaunted e-boats, came out to the attack. The officers and men with whom I rode wondered searchingly about this. They had been keyed up for some real German opposition, both from the air and the sea. Their trigger fingers were itching for a scrap, and they were a very disappointed lot at not getting it. If the Germans weren't just too timid to come out, the only other ready explanation that could be advanced was that they were too busily engaged in coping with the Allied air attacks made on their shore establishment as a prelude to the actual landing of troops. In the area we covered, we could see hundreds of bombers and fighters shuttling back and forth, dropping their bomb loads and returning to England for more explosives to blast the enemy. We could see the big two-engined American transport planes, also in the hundreds, returning to their bases in the United Kingdom after dropping their airborne troops in France. Yes, Terry had a lot to keep him busy last night and early today, but as far as the naval phase of our activity was concerned, not a shot was exchanged with the enemy while I was on the scene. For that preliminary phase of the show, at any rate, it was all too incredibly easy. We left our patrol torpedo boat based in daylight to accompany the slower-moving light advance guard of ships, which had to pave the way for the actual landing. One of our missions was to protect the Allied minesweepers, which cleared a wide channel straight to the enemy shore where our two transports and supply ships. Long lines of ships of every description were discernible on the skyline. Literally miles of craft in even columns converging upon the area in the channel marked for the concentration point for the actual invasion. Huge transports, tank landing ships, smaller troop landing craft, tankers and supply vessels of every kind plotted doggedly along under lowering skies tapering over heavy seas. You people at home would have been thrilled to the bone to have seen all these American men, American ships, and American supplies sailing calmly into the action for which they had been prepared and trained for so many miles. It was estimated that there were more than 4,000 ships of all kinds in the channel for this combined operation. By nightfall, we were nearing the French coast, and our watch tightened. But nothing happened. Even when a full... The moon, appearing fitfully from behind the clouds, gave our position away clearly to any enemy who may have been lying in wait for us. Then the fast and heavy combat ships moved up into position. All aligned themselves in the bombardment area to loose a hail of high explosives to protect the troops moving into the beaches on their landing craft. The warships started laying their smoke screens preparatory to shooting their guns. It was within only a few minutes of each hour of the long-awaited D-Day. And right there was where I got the biggest disappointment of my life. We turned around and headed back at high speed for the English coast. Our PT squadron was under orders to return to base and refuel for another mission as soon as its first operation was completed. So I didn't even hear the bombardment begin. But I can tell you that if things are going as well now as they look to be going at the time I left the scene, it won't be long before our trip troops have a firm foothold. That was a direct report from London, a rebroadcast by transcription, of the first eyewitness account from a reporter who covered the invasion aboard an Allied invasion. The report of NBC's Stanley Richardson, Somewhere in England. And now NBC continues its special invasion coverage. And for more late news reports, here is NBC's Don Goddard. Here's a bulletin just through. Transocean, in a Berlin broadcast, says the Allies have established a 15-mile front from a mile to a half a mile deep 
between Villers-sur-Mer and Trouville. This area is about seven miles south of the big port of Le Havre, where transatlantic liners docked in pre-war days, and it takes in the beach resort area of Deauville. And here's another bulletin. The British radio, just heard by NBC, by our monitors here, says that the Allied invasion line in France was sufficiently broad by evening to be more than a bridgehead. Then we have established more than a bridgehead on the northern coast of France. And a dispatch has just come through giving the location of one of our bridgeheads, or what is more than a bridgehead along the French coast now. Reporter Desmond Tagg stood on the deck of a British destroyer off the French village of bernier sur mer From that point, he watched the first wave of Allied troops storm on the beaches. bernier sur mer lies southeast of Le Havre. The reporter says the assault went on those smoking beaches and cordite smoke still curled skyward from a terrific bombardment by Allied warships. Wave after wave of khaki-clad figures stormed up the beach, overcame whatever opposition they found, won the immediate beachhead in a very short period of time, that beachhead that they have now expanded and are continuing to expand against German opposition. And soon after, the beachmasters had their organizations in order. Vehicles, guns, more troops, equipment of all descriptions were sorted out They were dispatched to their proper units. And shortly after that first wave of troops went ashore, one more division of Allied troops stormed in, bringing their equipment and battle supplies into Western Europe. And there on the beaches at Paris sur mer the Allies have established one of their ever-widening beachheads. But I think the most encouraging note that's come from General Eisenhower's headquarters in London is that statement that Allied losses have been much lighter than expected came in earlier this afternoon. Fewer American, British, and Canadian lives lost. Fewer French lives lost fewer Belgian and and Dutch lives in the initial stages of invasion than was expected. It's not told officially just where along the French coast our troops have landed, just how many beachheads we have established. But the indications are that we have at least two large ones, and one Swedish report says we have at least a dozen smaller ones. Perhaps many more points have been invaded by Allied invasion forces by this time. The landings have occurred in a hundred-mile stretch of coastline between the cities of Le Havre and Cherbourg, as you know. General Eisenhower hit that portion of the French coast that is lowest, and that has the widest beaches. He avoided, or he thus far has avoided, the heavily fortified cliffs opposite Dover where the Germans have set up their heavy naval guns and miles upon miles of fortifications and defenses in depth. There are several versions of progress made by our invasion units to this hour. The official version from London states that Allied forces have thrust several miles inland. The Germans say that Allied spearheads have pushed to a point about 15 miles from the coast now. Later, they said the front had been widened. It is evident now that the great military thrust of Western Europe caught the Germans by surprise. That's been agreed upon now thoroughly. Only a day or so ago, radios in Berlin were saying the hour for invasion had come and had gone, that there would be no invasion in the near future. And I'm afraid that a great many people in this country thought the same thing. The reports coming back from London say that only very light enemy opposition, much lighter than expected, has been met so far. Great fleets of the RAF, and American planes laid a carpet of bombs over the invasion area. From midnight to 8 o'clock this morning, 7,500 sorties were flown from England. 7,500 sorties from 8 o'clock to now. And the invasion fleet of 4,000 vehicles, several thousand auxiliary craft, took uh, part in landing the troops. 4,000 vessels, naval units, including heavy battleships, sailed in to within a mile of the shore, and they pounded away at German coastal positions so effectively that... Those guns, when they opened up in reply, showed that many of them had been hit. But London says our losses in invasion craft is very light. Either the uh, German aim was poor or their guns were knocked out before the main force of invasion craft came within firing range. And Berlin does admit that many thousands of paratroops and airborne soldiers spearheaded the great thrust in the hours of darkness last night, and they came on. The big Dakota transport planes flew over the channel with navigation lights showing so that they could keep formation. The airborne troops were dropped behind the German coastal defenses. There was very little loss among planes and personnel in the air prior to that landing. And the initial reports coming back from those isolated paratroopers say that they're holding their own. A German report says that Nazi tanks have been thrown into the fray to meet American tanks and British tanks. As yet, the vaulted Luftwaffe has not put in an appearance. Only about 50 German planes had been sighted over the entire invasion area up until 8 o'clock this morning. Fifty German planes against a total of some 7,500 Allied warplanes and more, 11,000 altogether flying there in the skies above that beachhead. But Allied airmen have warned that a violent reaction by American air forces is expected very soon. Reich Marshal Hermann Goering has issued an order of the day stating the invasion must be beaten off if the Luftwaffe has to perish. 
The grand assault was scheduled for yesterday, postponed for 24 hours because of bad weather. There was still heavy weather in the channel early this morning. Perhaps anxious moments in Allied headquarters until those uh, small craft had made the coast of France and disgorged their invasion cargo. Perhaps some of our soldiers became seasick in the crossing. Who knows? But the result of the fighting thus far do not show it. Prime Minister Churchill announced the invasion in the House of Commons six hours after the first seaborne troops had landed. He said the landings were the first of a series. He disclosed that 11,000 Allied planes were available for the fight. The Germans are said to have about one-fifth that number with which to combat the great offensive. Later on, Churchill made another speech to the House of Commons, reporting that things had gone better than our fondest hopes. And this is from your NBC newsroom in New York. This is Don Goddard speaking. NBC has cleared its schedule of all regular programs so that all day and all night you'll be able to hear the latest news of the invasion as it happens. This is the National Broadcasting Company. And now we bring you once more Quincy Howe. Here are some more news bulletins that have come in during the past few minutes. The Transocean News Agency of Berlin in a broadcast today said that the Allies had established a 15-mile front from a mile to half a mile deep between Via sur mer and Trouville. This area is about seven miles south of the big port of Le Havre, where a transatlantic liner is docked in the pre-war days, and it takes in the beach resort area of Deauville. And from London, the Allied air activity, already at a record peak, reached new heights this evening when swarms of fighters and bombers roared overhead toward the continent, wrapping the London area in an unending drone of powerful motors. And more details on this, the 10,000 tons of bombs cleared the way for the Allied army which invaded Europe today. And as the attacking planes swept through the French sky, only 50 German planes rose to oppose them. Allied aircraft ruled the skies not only over the invasion beaches, but also far inland. The first official reports of the greatest aerial operation of the war said that the Allies made 7,500 sorties between midnight and 8 a.m. In Parliament, Prime Minister Churchill said that an armada of 11,000 first-line planes sustained the assault. The 7,500 sorties between midnight and 8 a.m. did not take into account the hail of bombs, rockets, and bullets that crashed down upon the French coast in the hours following. During the period covered by the report, more than 1,000 British heavy bombers filled the night with thunder, and at dawn, the American 8th Air Force sent more than 1,000 of our heavies into the air. You've heard news and analyses of the invasion by William L. Shirer and Quincy Howe. For complete coverage of the invasion, keep tuned to your Columbia station. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Young Dr. Malone, presented by the makers of Post Toasties, will not be heard today. Until further bulletins on the invasion are received, we'll present a program of unannounced music.
CBS World News, which is bringing you the latest information from the French invasion beaches, will interrupt this program immediately to broadcast any news or special programs from abroad. We now rejoin the special music program.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The adventures of Perry Mason, presented by the makers of Cam A Soap, will not be heard today. Instead, we bring you more news of the invasion of Western Europe. One of the latest reports comes from the British radio, which said that the invasion line is now sufficiently broad to be considered more than a bridgehead. And now for the news direct from overseas, we take you to London, Merrill Muller reporting. Hello, NBC, American broadcasters. I'm, I'm clicking to you in about 20 seconds. Here it comes. Stand by. Okay. This is London at 8.45 p.m. In a moment, we hope to establish contact with the American radio reporter, Merrill Muller, covering General Eisenhower's headquarters, somewhere in England. Go ahead, Merrill Muller. This is Robert Barr speaking from Advanced Allied Command Post on the 6th of June. This is the stat... This is London again. There's been a slight dis delay in getting the broadcast just announced. One moment, please. By Duncan... One moment, please. At this time, we are attempting to establish contact with the American radio reporter, Merrill Muller, covering General Eisenhower's headquarters. One moment, please. In a few moments, we uh, hope to establish contact with our reporter with General Eisenhower's headquarters. In the meantime, will the American networks start programming from New York and await a call from London? We bring you now the latest dispatches on the invasion. The German Transocean News Agency said tonight that the Allied offensive area has been extended to the entire Norman Peninsula. 9th Air Force Troop Carrier Base, England. American Indians in full war paint, dropping silently from the skies to strike with the deadly stealth of their ancestors, were among the first paratroop units to go into action. They were members of an engineer's demolition unit, the Braves. They wore red and black war paint and had their heads shaved except for scalp lock. In training, they had taken the name the Filthy Thirteen. Except for their heads, they were a far cry from their ancestors. Each carried enough equipment to sustain himself in the field until his mission was accomplished and to care for wounds. One staff sergeant, a full-blooded Yaki, carried 180 pound attack on his 183 pound frame. Other members of the Filthy Thirteen were Yaki's and Cherokee's. They were part of the greatest airborne operation in history, 
which apparently caught German defenses by surprise. Dwight D. Eisenhower was the man who set H.R. and D-Day. President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill approved the battle plans at Quebec in August 1943, but selecting the exact time was left to the Supreme Commander. This was stated today in a 37-page unofficial invasion summary written by British officers and released by the War Office. The summary revealed that Roosevelt and Churchill agreed at Casablanca early in 1943 to knock Italy out of the war before invading France, even though they knew this would delay the Western assault until 1944. We've been trying to establish contact with Merrill Muller, radio reporter uh, at uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower's headquarters in London. However, in London, it was impossible uh, at the moment to establish contact with Mr. Muller. Until further bulletins on the invasion are received, we'll present a program of unannounced music.
take you now to London, Merrill Muller reporting. We regret that we're unable again to contact Merrill Muller. Until such time as we can, we continue our program of music. After station identification, we hope to bring you an address by His Majesty King George VI of Great Britain. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> 